A Second Chance Amish Romance Secrets Book 5 Written by Samantha Price Narrated by Susanna Coleman Chapter 1 I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Psalm 34, 4 Rebecca ran her hand along the neat row of her late husband Colin's clothes that were hanging evenly spaced on his side of the closet. Her eyes ran across the row of clothing, yet her fingers lingered on the strong, waterproof material of the dark blue jacket he used to wear most days in the fall. The material of the jacket was strong, yet flexible, qualities that Rebecca considered Colin had. Yet not even his strength was enough to save him from the car accident that had ended his life over ten years ago. A large knot formed again in Rebecca's stomach, as it did every time she thought of that wretched day. Rebecca shut her eyes tightly and wished that she would not even remember that day when the police came to her door with news of what had happened. The police had called it a freak accident that caused a large tree branch to fall on his car as he drove home in strong winds. Even though Rebecca had left the Amish long ago, she still believed in God and did not believe in freak accidents. She knew it must have been God calling him home. It was his time. Losing Colin was the worst thing that had happened in Rebecca's life. While she had come to terms with the fact that he had gone, she also had come to terms with the fact that the world and all the people in it just carried on as normal. It was as if nothing had happened, but something had happened. Colin had been taken away from her. She wanted the world to stop and to acknowledge that her Colin was gone, but the world carried on regardless. It was Rebecca's private pain that no one else would ever be able to understand. Tears filled her eyes at the thought of finally letting go of Colin's clothes. Clothes that she had made for him, with love. To other people, they may be just clothes, but to Rebecca, they were an expression of her creativity, fashioned for the man she loved dearly. It may not have been healthy for Rebecca's mourning process, but she found comfort in having his possessions close to her. It was as if a part of him were still there with her. How would she feel living in Jeremiah's house, not having all the reminders of Colin about her every day? There were so many memories in her house, the tiny little rip in the wallpaper near the top of the wall, which Colin accidentally tore while he was painting the ceiling. There was the little nick in the doorway leading to the kitchen that had occurred when Colin was moving the new refrigerator through the narrow space. Even though they had both disagreed on the colors for the walls, they compromised. The colors they compromised on were a stark daily reminder to Rebecca of their close bond. When it came time to repaint, Rebecca stuck doggedly with the colors they had chosen together years before. Even the garden was a reminder of Colin. She sat and read in the garden every day and gazed at the plants and flowers that they had chosen and planted together. A lifetime of memories was entwined in every inch of the house that they had purchased together so long ago. Rebecca took a deep breath and sat down on her bed. The pain of Colin's passing resided in her heart like a tightly coiled spring. Would leaving this house make Rebecca feel a little less pain? In the back of her mind, she wondered if things between her and Jeremiah were moving a little too quickly. Deep in her heart, she knew Colin would urge her to move on with her life and be happy with Jeremiah. But could she really do that? Rebecca loved Jeremiah and had said yes when he brought up the suggestion of marriage. She knew it was right. The love that Jeremiah and she had for each other. Yet somehow she wondered if she could really leave the past behind her and forge ahead with the new. Had she lived so long in the past that now she was unable to live in the present? With her plans of getting baptized into the Amish faith, her life was about to take a drastic change. She was just 19 years old when she left her Amish parents' home to marry Colin, an Englisher. A decision that she never regretted. Rebecca knew she would easily be able to return to the Amish lifestyle. She had loved the Amish lifestyle, and if it hadn't been for Colin, she would have gladly stayed. The close community with the family bonds is something that the English lifestyle just could not match. The only part of the Amish lifestyle she did not like growing up was living off the land and having to kill chickens. Her mom had told her that she had to kill the chickens so she could eat. It seemed that everyone thought nothing of killing the chickens except Rebecca. She was pleased that Jeremiah did not live on a farm anymore but lived in a modest house amongst Amish farmlands and only had enough land to raise vegetables. Rebecca glanced up at Colin's clothes. She could not bring them to Jeremiah's house when she became his wife. That would be ridiculous, 
and most likely hurtful to Jeremiah. She had not even shared with Jeremiah the fact that she still had all of Colin's things, through fear he would think her a little odd or even creepy. A wave of panic swept over her at the notion of not having the security of Colin's clothes. Rebecca did not know what to do. She did not know if she would be able to let them go. Rebecca's thoughts turned to her love for Jeremiah. She knew she was blessed to fall in love twice in one lifetime. She knew that many people never find true love even once in a lifetime. You there, Rebecca? Rebecca was jolted from her thoughts by the deep voice of her fiancé, Jeremiah. I'm coming. Rebecca closed the closet and her bedroom door and greeted Jeremiah at the front of the house. It's a nice surprise to see you. I thought I wouldn't see you until tonight, she said. I was just on my way home from giving the boys a bit of a hand in the store, he replied. Jeremiah gave Rebecca a hug while he spoke. They're getting very busy. Jeremiah owned a saddler's store, and his two sons ran it for him. Both sons had left the Amish some time ago and were both married to Englishers. Once they left the farm, Jeremiah could not manage it by himself, so he leased out the land to the Laps next door, keeping the house and the use of a little land surrounding the house. Rebecca breathed in Jeremiah's scent, which was freshly washed with just a hint of soap. His strong arms around her made her feel safe, as if she could do anything. Maybe she would be able to leave Colin's clothes behind her. She looked up into Jeremiah's kindly dark eyes, fringed by darker lashes. His face was all manly and strong from his jawline to the slight crookedness of his nose. Would you like some coffee? she asked. Rebecca felt a little guilty to harbor feelings for her late husband, almost as if she was not fully committed to Jeremiah. Was there a piece of herself she was not ready to give to Jeremiah? She knew that she loved both men, even though they were opposites in both looks and personalities. Yeah, that would be nice, he replied. Jeremiah followed close behind her to the kitchen. Rebecca admired the fact that Jeremiah always walked with strength and with purpose, shoulders back and head held high. Let's go and sit in the garden while the jug is boiling, she said. Rebecca took Jeremiah's large hand and led him to the white garden seat under the large old oak tree in the corner of the garden. Under that tree was Rebecca's favorite spot in the whole garden. She often sat and looked at the birds, which came to feed out of the bird feeder and play in the water fountain. Colin had made the bird feeder and hung it in the tree on the opposite side of the garden. Should be boiled by now. As Rebecca made the coffee, she looked out the window at Jeremiah. He was a kindly man, and Rebecca loved him dearly. He had strong beliefs about what was what. He was very black and white with how things should be. On the other hand, Colin had been more flexible and had tried to see all sides of a situation. Colin was only a little taller than Rebecca, and was fair in coloring, whereas Jeremiah was quite tall and his coloring was dark. Rebecca considered Jeremiah a most handsome man. Rebecca brought out two mugs of steaming hot coffee with a plate full of oatmeal cookies and set them on a small table in front of them. She knew that Jeremiah loved cookies. Even though Rebecca was a very good cook, she did not have the time to bake and preferred to buy from the local Amish bakery. She would rather spend any spare time in her garden. Rebecca was a seamstress and worked four days a week in the tailor's store that she owned in town, a short walk from her house. Oh, lovely, my favorite oatmeal cookies, he said. Jeremiah took a large bite and quickly consumed the whole cookie. Rebecca threw her head back and laughed. You say that about every cookie you eat? Chocolate chip cookies are your favorite? Coconut cookies are your favorite? And peanut butter cookies are your favorite? Jeremiah laughed with her. I do like cookies. Aren't you having any? He asked. No, I had one this morning. Yes, just one, Rebecca thought, as she watched Jeremiah consume a second cookie. She was a little envious that Jeremiah, with his large build and height, could eat anything he liked and would never gain a pound. Whereas it seemed to Rebecca, whenever she even just looked at a cookie, she gained weight. So, are you giving Eli a birthday present? Rebecca asked. That evening, they were to be at Jeremiah's son, Eli's house, for his birthday celebration. Jeremiah gave a little chuckle. No, I stopped giving them presents when they grew up, he replied. Rebecca wondered what would be appropriate for her to give Eli as a present. Maybe she should just take something like a bottle of wine or maybe a pie? She had always gotten along very well with Jeremiah's two sons, Eli and Paul. Eli was the oldest and very much the boss. He was also the one who managed the saddler's business, and Paul was the second in charge. 
He's turning 30, isn't he? She asked. Yeah, and I've just gone 60. I'm twice as old as him, he replied. The thought of going to a party with a lot of people she did not know was making Rebecca feel a little nervous. At least she thought, I'll have Jeremiah with me. Rebecca had become a bit of a recluse since Colin had died, only going to work and doing the necessary grocery shopping. It was only in the safety of her walled garden that she felt peace and security. The very same peace and security she felt whenever she prayed. She wondered whether she would be able to find a little sanctuary for herself at Jeremiah's house, like her walled garden. Rebecca's thoughts bounced back to Jeremiah, saying he was 60. You old thing. I didn't realize you were that old. I'd better get me a younger man. Rebecca laughed. You won't be getting away from me. It's taken me eight years to get you to marry me, he said as he smiled down at her. Besides, you're not that much behind me in age. Hasn't anyone told you not to refer to a lady's age? Rebecca picked a tiny piece of cookie off the plate. Surely a little portion like this won't do me any harm. Rebecca gleefully popped the little piece in her mouth and turned her attention back to Jeremiah. No, actually no one has told me that. Age is good. It is a sign of wisdom gathered over many years, he replied. Rebecca smiled, knowing that the Amish have a very different attitude towards aging than the English. The English are preoccupied with looking good and staying young whereas the Amish are more concerned with the goodness of a person and treating people nicely. The Amish and English treat their old folks so differently, Rebecca said. Jeremiah stretched back and put his hands behind his head. How? he asked. Well, for one, the elderly Amish people live with their families, but the older English people tend to go to retirement homes, she said as she looked at the last two cookies and wondered why she put so many on the plate. She continued, with the Amish, old people are respected, whereas in the English world, old people are not given much appreciation. Jeremiah said, I don't think I'd fit in at Eli's place or Paul's place. You'll have to look after me when I'm old, he replied. When? You're old now, Rebecca teased. They both laughed. Rebecca was thankful to have Jeremiah in her life after years of loneliness. She knew that God had brought them together. Jeremiah had told her that he felt something spark in his heart as soon as he walked into the tailors and saw her. Rebecca had felt the same as soon as she saw Jeremiah. Jeremiah stood up. I'd best be going now. I only called in quickly. I'll pick you up tonight at six. He leaned down and kissed Rebecca on her forehead. Yeah, I'll be ready, she replied. As Rebecca led Jeremiah to the front door, she reveled in the pleasure it gave her to have a man in her life again. She had someone to care about and to love again. She watched him drive away in his gray buggy. The clip-clop of horses' hooves always made Rebecca feel comforted, like she was home. Chapter 2 These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace in the world, ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. John 16.33 Jeremiah's heart was gladdened every time he was with Rebecca. He eagerly looked forward to the day that they would begin their lives as man and wife. He was pleased when she had agreed to live in his house, but he wondered if she would be comfortable living in the house that he had shared with his late wife. He always felt a little uncomfortable to walk into Rebecca's house, the house where she had lived with Colin. He had never asked Rebecca anything about Colin. His knowledge of Colin had just been gathered here and there from the little words that Rebecca had spoken of him. Jeremiah was no fool. He could see in Rebecca's eyes the great love that she held for Colin. Jeremiah wondered if he would ever measure up to Colin in Rebecca's eyes and in her heart. Jeremiah looked between the horse's ears at the road ahead and remembered his late wife, Rachel. He had hardly known Rachel when they had married. The marriage had been arranged for them by both sets of parents. However, Jeremiah had a bond with his wife and was dedicated to her. He loved her because she was his wife, and he looked after her and their two boys. A severe bout of pneumonia had taken her just as both boys had grown and left the Amish. Jeremiah had often wondered whether it was the sickness that took her, or whether it was the extreme sadness about both of her boys leaving home. Jeremiah had never known the love that he felt for Rebecca. He craved to be around her all the time. She made his heart glad when she was close. He smiled as he recalled how Rebecca was a cozy fit in his arms. He knew they were destined for a happy life together, a life that they both deserved since they had both known such sadness. If I hadn't known so much sadness, 
I may not have recognized such joy, Jeremiah thought. He recalled that Psalm 35 said something like, Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning, and Rebecca definitely made him feel very joyful. Rebecca decided to walk to the bakery and buy a pie to take to the party. Just as she opened the front door, she came face to face with a young teenage girl who had her hand up as though she was about to knock on the door. Hello? Rebecca scanned the young, skinny girl from head to toe. The girl looked a little scruffy, but her face looked pleasant enough. Hi, Rebecca. Yes. Rebecca thought that the girl looked vaguely familiar, but she couldn't think where she knew her from. That was, if she knew her at all. I'm Morgan, Colin's niece. Rebecca's mind was drawn to the past. She had met Colin's brother's family about 15 years ago when they had visited from Canada with their young daughter. Rebecca looked up and down the street to see if her parents or anyone was with her. What are you doing here? Are you alone? As soon as she spoke the words, Rebecca considered they sounded rather cold and rude, but she was in shock. The tall, thin girl looked at Rebecca through big, round, innocent eyes. I have nowhere else to go. Come inside. Rebecca stepped aside for the girl to enter her house. She noticed that she only had a small backpack with her, and by the look of her, she may have been traveling for days. Come this way. Rebecca led her to the kitchen. Do you want some coffee and something to eat? Oh, yes, please. Morgan sat at the table while Rebecca rattled around the kitchen. Maybe she's run away, Rebecca thought. She looks as though she hasn't eaten or slept for days. Tell me, Morgan, what's happened? Why is it you say you have nowhere else to go? Has something happened to your parents? No, nothing's happened to them. They just hate me and they kicked me out of the house. Morgan pushed strands of sandy, light brown hair off her pale, gaunt face. Rebecca's heart froze. What was she going to do with this girl who she hardly knew? She could not tip her out on the street. She had to offer for her to stay there, at her place, at least until they sorted something out with her parents. Heat suddenly rose up within Rebecca, like a furnace. Oh no, it's a hot flush. Rebecca hadn't had a menopausal hot flash in months. Rebecca picked up the nearest thing she could find to fan her face, a slimline recipe book. She turned so Morgan could not see what she was doing. Rebecca did not want to talk about hot flashes with a girl she barely knew. Are you hot? Morgan asked. Yes. It's a little hot today, don't you think? Rebecca turned around to see that Morgan tipped her head to one side and shrugged her shoulders. When the hot flash subsided, Rebecca put the recipe book down and finished making Morgan a roast beef sandwich. Here, have this and I'll get you a coffee. Morgan grabbed the sandwich in both hands without saying a word and ate it with great speed. By the time Rebecca placed the mug of coffee on the table, the sandwich was gone. Would you like another one? Morgan reached for the coffee. Yes, please. When Rebecca placed the second sandwich in front of Morgan, she sat down opposite her with a dress book in hand. I'll call your parents and see if we can work this whole thing out. Morgan nodded, and with food in her mouth said, Won't do any good. Rebecca ignored Morgan's comment. She knew she had their phone number in her address book, so she flipped through until she found it. I'll call them now. Rebecca talked to Walter, Colin's brother, for about ten minutes, and was informed that Morgan was out of control. There was talk of bad substances, alcoholic binges, and stealing. And after that, Rebecca's mind went blank. Rebecca had tried as hard as she could, but they did not want anything more to do with their daughter. They told Rebecca to kindly never call them again if it was anything regarding Morgan. Rebecca could not understand their attitude. How could someone abandon their own child? As Rebecca ended the call, Morgan said, I told you so. Rebecca looked across at Morgan. What do you plan to do? Rebecca asked. Can I stay here? I won't be any trouble. Otherwise, I'll have to live on the street. Somehow, Rebecca did not believe Morgan when she said that she would not be any trouble. Her parents must have had good reason for not having anything to do with their only daughter. You can stay here for a little while, but only a little while. A smile spread across Morgan's face. Thank you so much. It was a huge feat to get to Lancaster County from Canada. Rebecca could not even begin to imagine how she did that all by herself. How did you get here? A few buses. 
It took a long time. I imagine it did. Rebecca took a deep breath and wondered what she was going to do about the party that night. She could not leave Morgan in the house, not when the girl's own parents had mentioned stealing. There was only one thing for it. She would have to take her to the party. Rebecca had never had anything to do with teenagers or children for that matter, never having any of her own. She heard teenagers could be quite a handful and was worried that this one seemed very much like a handful. How old are you, Morgan? Rebecca picked up her coffee and had a little sip. Morgan had just finished the last of her second sandwich. Eighteen. And do you normally work? Morgan shook her head. I had one job in a tattoo shop. She lifted her sleeve to show Rebecca a tattoo on the front of her shoulder. It was a Chinese dragon in bright red and green. Oh, lovely! Rebecca had never known anyone who had a tattoo. It was well executed, Rebecca had to admit but she did not think any tattoo was lovely. What happened to the job? They said I stole money, but it wasn't me. It was the boss's girlfriend, and she blamed it on me. It was over five grand. So that's where her parents got the part about stealing money. Morgan's parents had not gone into any detail about the stealing. Morgan's father spoke as if he just wanted to get off the phone as quickly as possible and not speak about his daughter at all. Wow, that's a lot of money. Morgan wiped some crumbs from around her mouth. Yes, and I didn't take it. I wouldn't be so stupid. They called the police and everything. Really? Then what happened? It all sounded like a movie to Rebecca. Things like this just never happened in her life. The police didn't charge me because they had no evidence. They even watched the security footage and there was nothing of me taking any money. Of course, because I didn't do it. Mom and Dad didn't even believe me. Oh, that's terrible. The words tumbled out of Rebecca's mouth before she could stop them. She had never been a parent, but as an authority figure, she should not have spoken out against the girl's parents like that by way of sympathizing with her. Rebecca rubbed her head, as if rubbing it would make the stress go away. Morgan, tonight I've got a party to go to. Would you like to come along? Yes, please. I love parties. Rebecca thought that the types of parties Morgan might be used to and the party for a 30-year-old ex-Amish man might be two very different things. It will most likely be boring. It's for my fiancé's son, Eli. He's turning 30. You're getting married again? Rebecca nodded. Eli, is that an Amish name? I remember Uncle Colin said you used to be Amish. Morgan's green eyes seemed to grow even more round. Rebecca stood up and gathered up the empty plate in front of Morgan and carried it to the kitchen sink, which was just behind the table. Jeremiah is my fiancé, and he's Amish, but both of his sons have left the Amish. What was it like being Amish? Morgan asked. Rebecca chuckled. That's a very long conversation and one better left for another day. You look like you could use a little sleep before the party tonight. I am tired, Morgan said. This way. Rebecca led her to the small bedroom at the back of the house. The bathroom is that way, and there are some towels in the bathroom cupboard. Might be an idea if you have a shower first. I've got shampoo and everything else you'll need in there. Rebecca pointed to the bathroom. Feel free to use what you need. Morgan had been traveling for days, and she looked as though she had not had the opportunity to wash in all that time. Her hair was stringy and dirty, and she smelled of body odor and cigarette smoke covered up by cheap perfume. Oh yeah, I might be a bit on the nose. I couldn't wash on the bus and we only stopped at gas stations. And not for very long at all. Rebecca left Morgan alone to have a shower and a sleep. She had no idea what to do with this girl and wondered how long she might stay. Rebecca had just seen that God had answered her prayers when he brought Jeremiah into her life. Why did God bring Morgan to her? Did she have to work out the problems of someone else's life when she had only just started to work out her own? Chapter 3 Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. 1. Thessalonians 5.14 When Jeremiah pulled up the buggy at 6 p.m., Rebecca went out to meet him to tell him about Morgan. It was clear to Rebecca that he was not pleased. I don't know what to do. She's still asleep. She seems exhausted, Rebecca said. Jeremiah leaned back in his buggy seat. Leave her to sleep and come to the party. Rebecca shook her head. No, she might be scared if she wakes up and I'm not there. How old did you say she was, 18? 
I hardly think she'd be scared. She's a grown woman by 18, he replied. Jeremiah's tone was firm. Rebecca was too nervous to tell Jeremiah the whole story. She had left out the part about the stealing for fear Jeremiah might say not to let her stay at her place at all. I'll just check on her again. Rebecca went back into the house to see if Morgan was awake yet. Rebecca stood at the edge of her bed and saw that Morgan looked as though she were fast asleep. Morgan, Morgan, Morgan! Rebecca's voice increased each time she spoke her name. Morgan moved and opened her eyes slowly. What time is it? It's just gone six o'clock and we've got that party to go to, if you feel up to it. Morgan sat up slowly and stretched out her hands above her head. Yeah, I'll be fine. I'll get changed and be ready in a minute. Rebecca was relieved that Morgan would not be left alone in her home. Rebecca had some cash hidden in her house, and also two diamond rings that Colin had given her. If the stories about Morgan were true, she did not want to risk any of that being stolen. Since Rebecca had not had time to go to the store or the bakery due to Morgan's sudden arrival, she looked around her cupboards to see what she could take to the party. She did not want to turn up there empty-handed. Perfect. She put her hands on a bottle of red wine in the back of the cupboard that a client had given her the previous Christmas. This will do nicely, she thought. How's this? I don't have any other clothes with me. Rebecca spun around to see Morgan in very tight denim jeans that were very ripped and a black t-shirt with a large pink sequined heart in the center. That will do just fine. Rebecca knew that Jeremiah would not think it was fine, but what else would she wear if she had nothing else? She certainly would not have been able to fit into Rebecca's larger clothing since Morgan was very tall and very skinny. There was no alternative but to take Morgan to the party dressed just as she was. Jeremiah's here and we're going in his buggy. Once they were both outside the house, Rebecca turned to lock the front door. Oh, how quaint. I'm going to take a photo and put it on Instagram. Morgan reached into her bag and pulled out her cell phone and took photos. Rebecca leaned toward her. Don't let Jeremiah see you with that. The Amish don't like their photos being taken. You can photograph the horse and buggy if you like, but some other time. Not now. Rebecca glanced up at the buggy and was relieved that Jeremiah was positioned in the buggy where he would not have been able to see Morgan snapping away. Jeremiah, this is Morgan. Rebecca knew by the look on Jeremiah's face that he was uncomfortable about the way in which Morgan was dressed. Hello, Morgan. Nice to meet you, he said. Rebecca also knew that Jeremiah would be sure to complain about her clothing to Rebecca at a later stage. He would have been too polite to say anything to Morgan since he had only just met her. Jeremiah was a man who had very solid views on everything. The way in which a woman should dress was one of them, and it was not in tight, ripped jeans. Of this, Rebecca was certain. Hi. Morgan climbed into the back of the buggy. I've never been in one of these before. We're going to Eli's place, which is only a few streets away. It's his 30th birthday, Rebecca said. Ooh, that's old. Jeremiah and Rebecca smiled at each other. Eli's place was a beautiful, old, traditional, colonial home that Eli and his wife had restored over a period of five years. As they pulled up to the front of the house, Morgan said, Wow, is this it? I've never seen anything like it. She got out of the buggy and stared up at the impressive home. Rebecca stood next to her. Wait till you see inside. The fireplaces are amazing and there are marble floors and carved staircases. Jeremiah said, They've done a lot of work on it. I just love houses. I think I want to become a realtor. Morgan's face brimmed with enthusiasm. Eli and his wife Jenny came out of the house to meet them. After they had greeted each other and wished Eli a happy birthday, Rebecca said to Jenny, I hope you don't mind that I've brought my niece with us. Of course not. The more the merrier. As they walked into the house, Jeremiah whispered to Rebecca, why did you say she's your niece? She's not your niece. She's Colin's niece, and how could you let her come here wearing that? He asked. Rebecca looked up into Jeremiah's face. He was clearly aggravated by Morgan's arrival. Jeremiah liked to be in charge of everything. It was just his way. Morgan staying at her place without his approval was something that he was clearly annoyed about. It was easier just to say she was my niece. And anyway, she is my niece by marriage. Jeremiah grabbed Rebecca's hand. You'll be married to me soon, he replied. Rebecca was concerned by Jeremiah's attitude. He was taking the whole thing worse than she thought he would. To answer your other question, she hasn't brought many clothes with her. 
Their conversation ended abruptly as they entered the house. Rebecca hoped that Jeremiah's mood would improve during the party. Rebecca carefully considered what she had just said to Jenny. She had not wanted to bring up Colin's name in front of Jeremiah, so it was easier all the way around just to say that she was her niece. Why couldn't Jeremiah see that? Morgan turned to Jenny as soon as she stepped into the house. You've got a beautiful home, Jenny. Jenny's face beamed at the compliment. Thank you. Would you like me to show you over? Morgan's face lit up. Yes, I'd really like that. I love houses. As Morgan and Jenny left to take a tour of the home, Rebecca wondered why Morgan's parents wanted nothing to do with her. She seemed to be a nice, polite girl and so bright and bubbly. The party was to be held in the garden. Rebecca and Jeremiah stood in this kitchen looking into the garden through large glass doors. The guests were scattered throughout the garden, some seated and some standing on the terrace. The terrace was formed out of large old paving stones. Rebecca figured there to be around 20 to 30 guests already in the garden. She placed the bottle of red wine she had brought with her on the side table where she saw a lot of other bottles, which looked like they were intended for the party. Jeremiah turned and looked at the two chefs who were busy in the kitchen preparing the food. Jenny couldn't cook the food herself, he asked. Jeremiah looked disapprovingly at his son. No, Dad, she doesn't cook at all. We've had this conversation before. I like to do all the cooking, but not when it's my birthday. Eli replied as he rolled his eyes. It works for us. It may not be what you've been used to or how I was brought up, but it works, he said. What does Jenny do all day if she doesn't work? Jeremiah asked. Rebecca felt a little awkward, standing there listening to their bickering. It was clear that Jeremiah thought Eli's wife a very lazy and spoilt woman. Dad, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but this is my birthday, and I don't want to get into this conversation right now, he said. Jeremiah glared at his son, and Rebecca felt the tension hanging in the air. Eli turned to Rebecca. You probably know all these people, don't you, Rebecca? Rebecca could see that Eli was very much Jeremiah's son. He was the exact same height and build with the same dark hair. He also had the same stubborn streak that she saw in Jeremiah, which was most likely why he and Jeremiah regularly had hot disagreements. Rebecca looked at the guests. Yes, I think I know most of them. I see a couple of unfamiliar faces, though. We'll go out and mingle, you two, Eli said as he opened the glass doors for them to step into the garden. Rebecca knew that Eli would have been relieved not to speak to his father any longer than was absolutely necessary. Where's Morgan? Jeremiah asked Rebecca. Most likely still looking over the house. Rebecca hoped that Morgan was not making a nuisance of herself. It'll probably take a while as the house is so big, she told him. Chapter 4 We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn, and the day star arise in your hearts. 2 Peter 1 19. Rebecca. Rebecca turned to see Paul and his wife Narelle walking towards her. Hello, Paul. Hello, Narelle. She kissed them both. Paul nodded to his father. Hello, Dad. His wife kissed Jeremiah. It seemed to Rebecca that both Jeremiah's sons had quite a tense relationship with him. She wondered whether all of them being involved in the Sadler store had anything to do with it. She had often heard that small family businesses find it hard to work with each other and often end up squabbling. That's probably all it is, she thought. Paul was a little different in looks to Eli, his older brother by one year. He had the same dark looks and the same facial features, but he was shorter and a little plumper. Rebecca wondered whether Paul took after Jeremiah's late wife, Rachel, in looks. She had never met Rachel, and no one spoke of her, so it was a little difficult for Rebecca to find out what she was like. Rebecca heard Morgan's voice and turned to face her. The house is lovely, Rebecca. Have you seen around it? She asked. Yes, I've seen over it. It's beautiful, isn't it? Out of the corner of Rebecca's eye, she saw that Jeremiah, who had been standing next to her, was walking away. Rebecca was able to introduce Morgan to Paul and Narelle without interference from him. Will you be staying here long, Morgan? Narelle asked. I'm not sure what I'll be doing. I want to be a realtor so I'm going to find out about courses and things like that. Narelle put her head to one side as if she were carefully studying this young woman. That sounds interesting, 
Do you think you might be a little young? She asked. Oh, no. I can dress and do my makeup to look so much older. Everyone will be fooled. Morgan bunched her hair on the top of her head and pulled a face, which she must have thought made her look older. She certainly does have an engaging personality, Rebecca thought, as she saw how well Morgan was getting on with everyone. Everyone except Jeremiah. Norell laughed and said, Well, if you need a part-time job to tide you over, Paul and Eli are looking for someone for the store, she told her. Norell did all the bookwork for the family's Sadler's business. It was clear that this daughter-in-law had Jeremiah's approval because she worked and wasn't lazy, like the other daughter-in-law, Jenny. The fact that Jenny did not work and had no children to keep her busy was not good in Jeremiah's eyes. Jeremiah often said, if a woman doesn't have children, she should at least work in the home or outside the home. Jenny did not cook, clean, or work outside the home. Rebecca knew that Jeremiah was not impressed. Yes, we need someone two days a week at this stage, Paul added. Rebecca's heart thumped wildly as she listened to the conversation. Would that mean that Morgan thinks she can stay at my place? What will Jeremiah think? I know he won't be happy. Do I even want someone staying at my place? It's not a very convenient time with getting married and everything. Morgan jumped up and down in an excited manner. Oh, good. That sounds excellent. What would I have to do? Norell put a friendly hand on Morgan's shoulder. Well, we probably shouldn't talk business at Eli's party. Paul said, Why don't you come to the store 10 a.m. Monday morning? We can have a chat, he told her. Awesome. Morgan appeared to be bursting with excitement. This might cause another problem with his sons. Although Jeremiah owned the business, where his sons worked, he was not involved with the day-to-day -day management. Eli managed the store with the help of Paul, but that did not stop Jeremiah from expecting that he could suddenly have his say about something when he felt the need, which was often. Rebecca felt sick to the stomach when she recalled Morgan's parents had mentioned stealing. Rebecca recalled the saying that there is no smoke without fire and had to wonder where the truth lay. Paul and Norell moved away to speak to other people leaving Rebecca alone with Morgan. Morgan turned about her as if she were looking for something. So, is there any alcohol here? she asked. Rebecca glanced over her shoulder to see if she could see where Jeremiah had gone. You can't drink, Morgan. You're only 18. Morgan put her hands on her hips. No one will mind. I will mind. While you are staying at my place, you will live under my rules. Being an authority figure was something foreign to Rebecca. She had employees, but they had always been hard-working Amish girls and had never caused Rebecca any problems. Rebecca could only guess that would not be the case had she employed English girls to sew for her. I'll get you a soda. You stay here. When Rebecca came back with two sodas, Morgan was nowhere in sight. Jeremiah appeared and stood next to Rebecca. Here you are. Is that for me? He asked. Yes, you can have it. It was for Morgan, but I can't see her anywhere. She's in the corner over there talking to Ross and Marjorie, he replied. Jeremiah pointed toward an older couple, who looked like they were being thoroughly entertained by what Morgan was saying to them. Rebecca had never met the couple before. She keeps herself busy, doesn't she? He said. Rebecca was worried that Jeremiah would be upset that Morgan was going for an interview on Monday at the Sadler's. Since Jeremiah had not mentioned it to Rebecca, she guessed that no one had mentioned anything to him. Yes, she's not shy. Jeremiah asked, And what's she wearing? How did you let her leave the house like that? Is that a cigarette in her hands? Rebecca was not listening to what Jeremiah was saying to her. She was studying Morgan. She could see that Morgan had a glass in one hand and a cigarette in the other. Yes, she was sure it was a wine glass, after she had told her that she was not allowed to drink. If she wasn't old enough to drink, she certainly was not old enough to smoke. I'll be back in a minute. Rebecca handed her glass of soda to Jeremiah and marched toward Morgan. Morgan, is that wine? Why are you smoking? Ross leaned forward. It's okay. She told me she wasn't allowed, but I said it was okay if she just had one. Rebecca turned to Ross, her eyes blazing with fury. Oh, I'm sorry. You are her father? No, Ross said quietly, while his wife Marjorie looked on with a look of shock on her face at the normally quiet Rebecca. Well, I'm looking after Morgan, and I said that she strictly could not have a drink tonight. It's obvious that she's too young to smoke, isn't it? She knew that she was being rude to these people, Ross and Marjorie, but she was seeing red and did not care what people thought of her. 
not at that moment. Rebecca figured she should continue with her new personality that had evolved out of nowhere. She grabbed the glass out of Morgan's hand and threw the wine in the garden. Then she took hold of the cigarette, dropped it to the ground, and squished it with her shoe, turned to Morgan and said, Come with me. Rebecca walked toward Jeremiah. No. When Rebecca spun around to face her, she saw that Morgan had crossed her arms in front of her and was leaning back, her eyes laced with defiance. Rebecca's eyes fixed onto Morgan, but out of the corner of her eye she could tell by their body language that Marjorie and Ross were embarrassed by the scene. Concern rippled down Rebecca's back at Morgan's unexpected response, and by the look on her face she was not going to back down easily. She knew she had to put on a show of being tough now that she was a parental figure. Oh, really? Where might you be sleeping tonight, then? It gets mighty cold around here, especially around the parks. Rebecca gave Morgan an icy stare as she emphasized the word, parks. Under Rebecca's gaze, Morgan uncrossed her arms and lowered her shoulders. Okay. Rebecca was most relieved that Morgan had not called her bluff, but did her best not to show it. With shoulders back and head held high, she walked with Morgan back to Jeremiah. What was all that about? Jeremiah said while his eyes darted from Rebecca to Morgan. Morgan began to speak before Rebecca had enough time to even think what she was going to say. They were really nice people and I was having a good talk to them. He used to be a realtor and he was telling me all about it, until she came along. Her name is Rebecca, not she. There's no need for rudeness, he said. It's for your own good. Rebecca said as she turned from Morgan and faced Jeremiah. Morgan was drinking and smoking when I said she was not to drink. She's far too young for that nonsense, Rebecca said as she took her soda back from Jeremiah. Jeremiah walked away from both of them, but not before Rebecca heard him mutter. I'm too old for this. Morgan folded her arms across her chest again in a manner of defiance. See, you've upset Jeremy. I drink all the time at home. Rebecca pulled her best angry face at the young teen. It's Jeremiah, not Jeremy. Shall I call your parents and ask them if you drink all the time at home? I guess you don't need to do that. Morgan uncrossed her arms. Yes, and I'm too old for this nonsense too, Rebecca thought. Jeremiah's this upset and he doesn't even know that Morgan might be getting a job in his own business. Jeremiah had to walk away, or he knew he would say something that he might regret. His life had been going perfectly up to this point. He'd finally got the courage to ask Rebecca to marry him, and she had agreed. Now what was to become of their plans? It certainly would not work to bring Morgan along and have her live in his house when he was newly wed to Rebecca. That would not do at all. Morgan was rude and insolent, qualities that Jeremiah just would not tolerate especially in someone younger. Young people were supposed to show respect to their elders. Jeremiah's children had been well-behaved, as were all of the children in the Amish community. She's clearly too English, Jeremiah thought. All Jeremiah wanted was to have a nice, quiet, and peaceful life with his beautiful Rebecca. Surely that wasn't too much to ask. I hope that Morgan does not come between Rebecca and myself. Rebecca knew from her own upbringing that Amish children were brought up to be extremely well-behaved and polite. The cheekiness and rebellion that Morgan displayed would be something that was very foreign to Jeremiah. Rebecca wondered if she should tell Jeremiah's son, Paul, that Morgan had been accused of stealing at her last job. She figured he would most likely ask for some sort of references, so decided not to say anything. But she prayed to God that it would all work out for the best for everyone. God must have sent her here all the way from Canada for a reason, Rebecca thought. Chapter 5 Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Psalm 51, 10 Jeremiah and Rebecca's plan had been for Rebecca to get baptized into the Amish faith and live with her friends, Kate and Benjamin, for a short time until their wedding day. Now, with Morgan staying at her house, Rebecca did not know how those plans could work. It was clear that Morgan could not stay alone in Rebecca's house. The house would most likely be sold anyway. On the Monday of Morgan's job interview, Rebecca accompanied her and had a quick word with Paul before the interview. She told him that she did not really know Morgan very well. And even though she was Colin's niece, she could not personally recommend her for the job. This way, Rebecca thought, I have kept out of things. But at the same time, they know she does not come with my recommendation. 
Rebecca sat outside the store on a wooden bench and read a book while she waited for Morgan's interview to be finished. Although the weather was pleasant, with the gentle sun warming her back, the hard seat was getting rather too hard for her bottom. She kept switching the position of her legs to remain comfortable. An hour later, Morgan finally came bouncing toward her. I've got the job, Aunt Rebecca. Morgan sat on the seat next to Rebecca. Rebecca patted her on the shoulder. Congratulations. When do you start? Tomorrow at 9 a.m. Rebecca looked at what Morgan was wearing, which were jeans and a plain black t-shirt. Come on, then. We'd better get you some suitable clothes to wear. Rebecca put her book into her bag and stood up, glad to be able to get some circulation back into her legs. Morgan remained seated and stared up at Rebecca. I don't have any money. That's okay. You can pay me back when you get on your feet a bit. Rebecca was quite well off financially and normally would have paid for it without wishing to be paid back. However, with Morgan, she thought it best to give her the responsibility of paying her own way so she could learn to manage her own money. Morgan quickly rose to her feet. Thanks so much, Rebecca. I mean, Aunt Rebecca. Rebecca laughed. You can call me Rebecca. I'm not used to being called anything else. As they walked toward the clothing stores on the main street, Rebecca wondered if she would be able to get Morgan out of bed for a 9 a.m. start. She had found it quite difficult to get Morgan out of bed and ready for the 10 a.m. interview that very day. However, would she get out of bed for a 9 a.m. start? Rebecca usually got to the tailor store at 10 a.m. on the day she worked, so that would give her enough time to get Morgan up and out of the house. It's so exciting. I love horses. They have everything in there for horses. They even custom make saddles and bridles. That's what I want to do with my life. I want to have my own store like that. What about becoming a realtor? Rebecca asked. You've talked for two days straight about being a realtor and selling houses. Oh, I'd like to do that too and have my own tattoo business. Rebecca laughed and thought it was good that Morgan had so much enthusiasm. Once they had gone through all the clothing in the third store and still had not bought anything, Rebecca came to the conclusion that shopping with a teenager was most challenging. They had not agreed on anything. Listen, Morgan. You don't have to like these clothes or wear them other than for work. The things that you like just aren't suitable to wear for work. All right, then I'll get those ones. She pointed to the things Rebecca had in her arms. But can you buy me this one too? Morgan held up a dark gray t-shirt that had a pattern of silver skulls all the way through it. Rebecca pulled a face as though she had just tasted a sour lemon. Not for work. For me to wear when I'm not working. No. Morgan, I won't. That's just horrible. It's a terrible shirt. Why would you want to wear skulls? Yuck! Rebecca tapped the clothing she was holding. We're here to buy you work clothes. Morgan threw the t-shirt back down on a table with some other shirts. You just don't understand my style, that's all. Her tone was rude. She looked down at the ground with a sullen expression on her face. Well, how about we just forget the whole thing? Rebecca tried to use some psychology and placed the clothes she had chosen back on the racks. Morgan looked at Rebecca as though she were a little surprised, and then lifted up her chin and said, Let's just forget the whole thing. Morgan walked to the door of the store ahead of Rebecca. Rebecca had no idea what she should do or say next. This was foreign territory to her. She had not expected Morgan to say that. What would she do now? She knew Morgan would most likely be sent home if she turned up to work in her usual clothing of old ripped jeans. Had she backed herself into a corner? The only thing she could do was call Morgan's bluff and follow through with what she had just said. She walked right out of the store, passing Morgan at the door. Maybe what you have will be all right for work. When Rebecca was out on the street, she turned and said, or maybe they'll send you home and you'll lose your job. Rebecca kept walking and called over her shoulder. Are you coming? Morgan stood in the doorway of the store and called. I'm sorry, I've been horrible. Maybe we could just get those clothes then, if that's still all right. Rebecca shrugged her shoulders and walked back into the store. All right then. She tried to sound as if she did not care one way or the other. All the way home, Morgan talked about the Sadler's business and how excited she was to have the job. She had such a vibrant personality that Rebecca couldn't help but be pleased in her company. Rebecca hoped that Jeremiah would not be too angry when he found out that Morgan had a job in his business. 
as he was coming to dinner that night. She decided to cook his favorite food in an effort to put him in a good mood. As soon as she heard the familiar hoofbeats, Rebecca raced to the door to let Jeremiah in. She wanted to tell him about Morgan working at the store before Morgan told him. Jeremiah met her at the front door and leaned down and kissed Rebecca on the forehead. Come in. Rebecca took hold of his large hand and led him through the house and out to the garden. Dinner will be ready in about half an hour. As they sat, Jeremiah said, Smells great. Roast chicken? He asked. Yeah, I know it's your favorite. And we're having date pudding for dessert. Wonderful, Jeremiah said as he rubbed his hands together. Rebecca laughed and decided it was the perfect time to break the news about Morgan. Did you hear that Paul and Eli offered Morgan a job at the store? She asked. Yeah, Paul told me at the party that he had Morgan coming in for an interview. They do need to train someone in sales, he replied. Rebecca was more than a little shocked that he was taking it so well. He did not even know Morgan and seemed to think she was a little unruly. It didn't make sense that he was taking the news so well. So, you don't mind? Not at all. A girl like that needs to be occupied. Idle hands and minds are the devil's playground, he replied. His saying about the devil's playground reminded Rebecca of the Amish household she had grown up in, where she had often heard those words. I'm so pleased. I thought you might think that they were doing things without including you, she said. Jeremiah shook his head. No, Eli and Paul can manage the place. They're quite capable. Rebecca still felt a little guilty that she had not told Jeremiah that Morgan had been accused of stealing. She would have never kept anything like that from Colin, but Colin was a different sort of man. Jeremiah could be a little hot-headed at times. Let's talk about us, Rebecca. We're too often talking about other people, he told her. Rebecca nodded. Okay. I've been doing some thinking, and it might be a good idea if we got a new house. So we start our life together fresh. We can create new memories together in a house that is our own, without reminders of the past, he said. A small knot formed in Rebecca's throat and tears threatened to escape her eyes. That would be lovely. This was the thoughtful, tender Jeremiah that she had fallen in love with. He could be so short-tempered and hot-headed, but he had a soft and gentle side as well. I know you've got a lot of memories here of you and Colin. I've got memories about Rachel in my house. It makes sense if we build something together, he said. What? You mean from scratch? At that moment, two hummingbirds caught Rebecca's eye. They were chasing each other and frolicking around the water feature. She took it as a little sign from God that the two of them would be very happy together, just like those two little birds. Look at those birds, Jeremiah. Hummingbirds. You hardly ever see them that color around these parts, he replied. They're so pretty. They were iridescent red and purple, and they flapped their wings so hard they appeared to buzz. God's creatures are beautiful, he said. Jeremiah put his arm around Rebecca. Rebecca reached up and stroked his hand. Yeah, they certainly are. They both sat in silence and watched the two birds play until they flew away. Jeremiah was the first to speak. We can build a house from scratch if that is what you would like to do, he said. No, that sounds like hard work. I think we both need to take things easy at our age. We could buy one already finished, she told him. Jeremiah took his arm away from her shoulder and held both her hands in his. I would like it if we both sold our places and both leave the past in the past and we start afresh, he said. Rebecca smiled as she looked into his kind, handsome face. I would like that very much. Jeremiah put his strong arm around Rebecca once more and held her close to him. I was reluctant to sell the farm because it was the boy's inheritance, but I could sell the farm and give them a sizable share while I'm still alive and still have plenty left for a good-sized house for us, he suggested. Can we make a lovely garden like this one so we can watch the birds enjoying themselves? Rebecca asked. Yeah, we will also plant things together and watch them grow, he replied. The thought of having their own new home, planting a garden from scratch, and having the satisfaction of watching it grow, pleased Rebecca immensely. Jeremiah cleared his throat. How long do you think Morgan is going to stay with you? He asked. I'm not sure. She probably won't earn enough money to get her own place if she's only working part-time. Rebecca thought of the flat above the tailor's store that she owned. It was vacant now, so Morgan could stay there. But Rebecca thought it best to keep a close eye on her. 
Rebecca was aware that Jeremiah and she had not set a date for the wedding, and with Morgan staying under her roof, it seemed like the wedding would not be any time soon. I better go in and see to the chicken. I don't want it to be overcooked. I'll come inside with you, he replied. Rebecca called out to Morgan, who was in her room. Morgan, can you come and set the table? Morgan came out of her room. I'm starving. Oh, hello, Jeremiah. Morgan walked up to Rebecca. Why can't he set the table? Young lady, my name is Jeremiah, or better still, Mr. Troyer, to you. Rebecca has been good enough to cook you this lovely meal, and all she has asked you to do is to set the table, he said firmly. Morgan looked defiantly at Jeremiah. Jeremiah continued, You are living here out of the goodness of Rebecca's heart, so do not take advantage of her generosity. Are you going to question everything you are told to do when you start work at my store too? he asked. Morgan unfolded her arms. Oh no, I wouldn't. I can't wait to start work there. Well, don't do it here. Jeremiah's voice was loud and firm. Morgan opened the cutlery drawer. Sorry, Mr. Troyer. Sorry, Rebecca. That's better, Jeremiah said as he took a seat at the kitchen table. Morgan picked up a handful of cutlery. It's just that I was busy in my room in the middle of a game. Jeremiah raised his hand in the air. No excuses. Just do what you've been asked. Maybe next time you could help Rebecca with the meal rather than play silly childish games, he said. Rebecca thought that Jeremiah was speaking a little too harshly, yet his treatment and manner of speech toward Morgan seemed to be working surprisingly well. Morgan lay the knives and forks on the table. She didn't ask me to help her. Rebecca felt that maybe she should have asked Morgan for some help with the dinner. It would do her good to have some responsibility. Rebecca shouldn't have to ask you to help with anything around this place. While you are staying here, I expect you to help with the cooking and the cleaning. Don't wait to be asked, he told her. Morgan spoke quietly as she placed the cutlery on the table. All right. Sorry, Rebecca. Rebecca felt most uncomfortable listening to them. Chapter 6 Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Romans 6.16 Rebecca could not wait to get to work that day so she could tell Kate and Sarah, the Amish sisters who worked for her, all about her visitor. Kate and Sarah had become good friends with Rebecca, even though they were much younger. Kate had worked for Rebecca for over 12 years, and Kate's sister Sarah had worked for her for around eight years. Both girls worked four days a week and only had taken time off when they were having babies. Rebecca was bursting to tell both of them her news, but decided to wait for their mid-morning break. She hoped that they might be able to offer some good advice. What are you going to do, Rebecca? Kate asked as she handed a mug of coffee to Rebecca. Weren't you going to get baptized and stay with Kate and Benjamin until you get married? Sarah added. Rebecca lifted the hot mug to her lips and hesitated as the wave of hot steam let her know that the coffee was extremely hot. That was the plan. I don't know what I'll do now, and I don't even know how long she's staying for. I don't think that Jeremiah likes the fact that she's there at all. Kate took her position at the work table that they were gathered around. You can hardly ask her to leave. Where would she go? Kate asked. Rebecca shrugged her shoulders. Kate sipped on her coffee and then placed it back on the table. You could always bring her along to my house as well, Rebecca. The house is plenty big enough now that Benjamin has built the new extension. Rebecca thought about living with Kate after she was baptized and having Morgan stay there as well. If she was to do that, she had to tell Kate what Morgan's parents had told her when she called them. I don't mean to spread rumors or gossip, but Morgan's parents won't have her at their place for a reason. They mentioned to me about bad substances and stealing, Rebecca said. Well, there's nothing to steal at my house and there are no bad substances. Kate giggled. Thank you for the offer, Kate. I guess I'll just wait and see how things work out. Sarah had refused coffee for the second time that day and was drinking a glass of milk. It must be hard. I've heard that English teenagers can be very trying, Sarah said. Rebecca looked at Sarah's milk. Sarah, are you expecting another baby? Sarah put her hand over her mouth. Kate stood to her feet. Ah, Sarah, you aren't, are you? Kate asked. Sarah nodded. I'm not sure yet, but I think so. You're catching up to me. We'll both have four. 
Kate ran over and kissed her sister on the cheek. Your mom is going to be busy, Rebecca said. Both Sarah and Kate left their children with their mother to look after when they came to work. She loves to look after them. She always wanted to have more than four children herself, Kate said. Rebecca leaned over and kissed Sarah on the cheek. Congratulations, Sarah. That's wonderful news. Well, I'm not really sure yet, Sarah said. The only time you don't drink coffee is when you are expecting. That's sure enough for me. Rebecca laughed. And for me, Kate said. Anyway, don't say any more until I know for sure. I don't want to get my hopes up. Sarah looked at both women until they nodded in agreement. So what does Jeremiah say about the whole thing with Morgan? Rebecca laughed and shook her head. I think he would be happy if I told her to go. He told me that she's not my problem. She is in a way, though, because if you tell her to go, she'll be homeless. I know how it feels to have nowhere to turn and it's not very nice, Sarah said. Rebecca considered the bad situation that Sarah had been through many years ago. She had gotten involved with an Englisher and found that she was expecting a baby, and she had to hide that fact from her parents. Finally, things worked out for her, and she and the baby's dad were now happily married. Now they had two more babies, and both Sarah and her husband John had been baptized into the Amish faith. You helped me, Rebecca. If you hadn't given me a place to stay, I don't know what I would have done or where I'd be now. Sarah was referring to the time that Rebecca had let her stay in the apartment above her tailor's store. Sarah's words helped Rebecca know that she was doing a good thing in helping Morgan. Sarah's life had turned out well, and Rebecca was sure that God had placed Morgan in her path for a reason. Rebecca recalled the scripture, Matthew chapter 25 and verse 40. The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Oh, you would have been fine, Sarah. Rebecca was a little embarrassed at being given praise. Well, no one knows that for sure. All I know is that I'm very grateful, Rebecca, and I will never forget your kindness. Sarah finished the last of her milk. Rebecca glanced at the large round clock on the wall. Well, come on, girls, we better get back to work. These clothes aren't going to sew themselves. Rebecca had made sure she was home from work a little earlier than usual so she could be there when Morgan walked through the door. So how was work? Morgan slumped in the soft couch in the living room opposite Rebecca. I loved it. The people were great and I loved learning about everything they sell. Really? It was as if she really did not like it and was covering up the fact. Morgan nodded enthusiastically. It's really good that you have found some part-time work quickly, but have you thought what you're going to do about your parents? Morgan shrugged her shoulders as if she did not care less about her parents. What about them? This was going to be harder than I expected, Rebecca thought. Do you think that maybe you should try and work things out with them so that you can go home? I don't want to go home. Besides, I like it here. Morgan nibbled on a fingernail. Unless you don't want me here. She looked across at Rebecca. Rebecca did not see that she had any room in her life for this unexpected visitor, even if she was a relative of Collins. How was she to make plans for her own life when she had to take Morgan into consideration? Rebecca did not know whether to make plans that included Morgan or not, as Morgan might very easily leave just as quickly as she had arrived. Morgan, you know I'm going to get married. Morgan clapped her hands together. Oh yes, can I be a bridesmaid? I've never been a bridesmaid. Rebecca couldn't help but laugh. It's an Amish wedding. We have attendants. And no, you can't be an attendant. The point I'm trying to make, Morgan, is I have to get baptized before I marry Jeremiah, and after that I can't live here. I've arranged to move into my Amish friend's house. Morgan looked around the sitting room. Why can't you live here? Amish don't have electrical wires coming into the house and don't believe in having many of the things that are in this house. They prefer to have a simple life and steer away from anything that's modern. It's easier for me to get baptized and stay at my friend Kate's house until I get married. Rebecca noticed that Morgan was looking a little blank, as if she just did not understand what she was saying. I can't get baptized and come back and live here as it just would not be acceptable. This is an English lifestyle to live in this house, with electricity and phone lines. Do you see? Why don't they like electricity and phone lines? Rebecca took a deep breath. The Amish like to keep separate and not have anything to do with the outside world. Their home is like their haven. 
If electrical wires came into the home, that would be like the outside world is coming into their home. With electricity comes television, video games, and family time would be lost. There are quite a lot of reasons not to have electricity or any other wires, like phone wires coming into the home. Can I stay here then? Rebecca laughed at Morgan's cheekiness. No, you can't. The place will be sold, most likely. What will happen to me? Rebecca couldn't work out why this girl had suddenly attached herself to her almost like a shellfish onto a rock. That's what we'll have to figure out. Do you have any thoughts? Morgan shook her head and once again nibbled on a fingernail. No, I don't. Rebecca felt sorry for Morgan and imagined that she must feel very alone in the world. You could look for another part-time job and save up and rent a little apartment? I suppose so. Rebecca took a deep breath. You can stay with me until you can get an apartment. A beaming smile covered Morgan's face. But there has to be rules. Morgan raised her eyebrows and jutted out her bottom jaw at the mention of rules. No swearing, no disrespect, and you have to do what I ask at all times. Understood? Morgan nodded and her lips turned slightly upwards at the corners. Yes, Rebecca. Rebecca was not very happy with her suddenly changed situation. She could not turn this girl out on the street, but now her own life plans had to be changed to accommodate someone who days ago she barely knew. How life throws me twists and turns. Rebecca thought. Maybe God is testing me. Now all that she had to do was break the news of Morgan's extended stay to Jeremiah. Early the next morning, Rebecca took a taxi to Jeremiah's home to let him know what was happening with Morgan. What? So when are we going to get married and when are you going to be baptized? He asked as he frowned. Rebecca felt her neck and shoulders tighten. She had no answers to his questions. I'm not sure, but I can't just throw her into the street, can I? Rebecca, she's not your responsibility, even though she is Colin's niece. Rebecca inhaled deeply and moved her shoulders slightly to lessen the pain that had just gripped them. I know, but what am I to do? Jeremiah began pacing up and down. Send her back to her parents, he said firmly. Her parents told me that they don't want her back, she replied. Why don't they want her back? He asked. Rebecca bit her lip. Jeremiah would never understand if she told him about the stealing, drinking, and the bad substances. They had a big fight. Jeremiah placed himself on the couch next to Rebecca and held her hand. At this stage in our lives, we need to be enjoying ourselves. You don't need to be looking after this girl. You don't need to try and sort her life out, he told her. I do, though. Can't you see that, Jeremiah? If I don't, who will? Who else has this girl got? As Rebecca spoke to Jeremiah, she wondered if there were any traces of Jeremiah's late wife around his house, just as there were reminders of Colin at her house. She tried hard not to appear to be looking around. Jeremiah sucked in his lips and looked at the ceiling as if he was trying to think of a solution. I don't know, Rebecca. I just don't know. Where does this leave us? He asked. It leaves us where we always were. We might just have to delay things a little, that's all. I'm not happy to do that. I want you to be my wife as soon as possible, he said. I want that too, but I'm trying to do my Christian duty and look after this girl. She's got nowhere else to go. Nonsense. She's a grown woman. You're just treating her like a baby. I've had two children, Rebecca, and you've had none. So I have some experience in the things I'm saying to you, he replied. Rebecca wasn't about to say it, but thought, you've never had a girl only two boys, and I'm sure girls are different to bring up than boys. It also made sense to Rebecca that if someone was brought up in the English world, they would not suddenly respond to being treated as if they had grown up Amish. What would you have me do? Put her out in the street? The way I see it is this. You've given her a comfortable place to stay so she doesn't have to go home and make amends with her parents, he said as he scratched his head in an agitated manner. You are enabling her to be stubborn and not see the error of her ways. She needs to go through a hard time so she will see what she has done wrong. Once Jeremiah put it like that, Rebecca could see some sense in what he was saying, but at the same time, she knew she would never have the heart to tell Morgan that she had to leave. After her talk with Jeremiah, Rebecca was still at a loss to know what she was going to do with Morgan. Chapter 7 Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. 
but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Matthew 6, 19, 21 Rebecca had made the firm decision to delay her marriage to Jeremiah while Morgan was still living in her home. It was clear to Rebecca that Jeremiah was not happy about her decision, and he was also not happy for her to have Morgan staying at the house with her. It was a Friday three weeks after Morgan had started her job at the Saddlers, and she was making toast for breakfast before she began work that day. Rebecca woke up to loud noises in the kitchen. She staggered out and was amazed to see Morgan fixing breakfast. Rebecca sat down at the kitchen table. Ah, uh, you managed to get yourself out of bed this morning. Yes, I went to bed earlier so I could get up early today. Do you want me to get you toast and coffee? Morgan asked. Yes, please. Rebecca wondered why Morgan had suddenly changed. She worked three days a week in the Sadler's store, and every one of those days Rebecca had found waking her in the morning to be a real effort. Today, here she was, bouncing around the kitchen full of life. Is there any special occasion today? Any reason you've bounced out of bed this early? Just love and life, that's all. Rebecca studied Morgan's face just as Morgan looked up and caught her eye. Morgan laughed. Okay, there's this boy. Oh, now that explains this new behavior, a boy. Tell me about him, Rebecca said. Morgan got the toast out of the toaster and began spreading it. He's so good looking, really hot. He's tall and, ooh, I just remembered I took a photo of him when he wasn't looking. Morgan picked up her cell phone that was always beside her and pushed some buttons. Here. Rebecca looked at the photo and was surprised to see that it was a young Amish man. He's Amish? Morgan giggled loudly. I know, crazy, isn't it? Rebecca had only glanced at the photo and hadn't taken much notice, but when she thought about it further, she realized that the boy looked vaguely familiar. Wait a minute, let me look at that photo again. Morgan handed Rebecca her phone again, with the photo still on the screen. Rebecca gasped and covered her mouth. I don't believe it. I know him. She handed the phone back to Morgan. That's Sarah, Kate, and Annie's brother. Who are Sarah, Kate, and Annie? They are my good friends. Kate and Sarah both work for me. Rebecca was regretful that she had told the two girls all about Morgan. It was hardly giving her a fair chance if she liked their brother. Now they would think poorly of her. Rebecca had never been a gossiper, and the only time she shared information it looked like it may do Morgan some damage to her reputation. Rebecca knew that reputation amongst the Amish was an important thing. What if Morgan and Jacob are destined to be together? I've hardly set her up with a good start with his family after I told them about the bad substances and even stealing. His name's Jacob, Morgan said. Yeah, yeah, that's right, Jacob Miller. Rebecca felt a warm glow well up within her. What are the chances of this? Is this why God sent Morgan all the way here from Canada? Rebecca wondered. Morgan ignored the toast that she had been spreading with jam, while she stared at Jacob's photo. So how old do you think he would be? Rebecca replied. I'd guess he must be around 18 by now when I add up all the years. I hadn't realized he'd grown up so fast. I always think of him as just a boy. Morgan put the cell phone down and handed Rebecca the toast, while she continued with her story. I didn't talk to him or anything. I just saw him. I was in the back room when he came in. I saw him and took his picture when I was still out the back. Rebecca took the plate from Morgan's hands and placed it in front of her. She did not eat jam, but decided to eat it today, as she did not want to discourage Morgan now that she had finally started to help around the place. Morgan, I told you not to take photos of Amish folk. Morgan put her hands on her hips. What does it matter? No one saw me. Rebecca frowned. That's not the point, and don't take that tone with me. Rudeness won't get you anywhere. Sorry, Rebecca. So anyways, I left the back room and went out into the front of the store and asked Eli if I could help him with anything. Eli let me finish up the sale. How was it that you didn't say anything to each other? Wasn't there a thank you or something from him when you handed him the goods? Rebecca asked. Oh yeah, things like that, but no personal talk like how are you, who are you, where are you from, you know? Nothing like that, Morgan replied. I see. He just smiled at me a lot. I hope he comes in again. I'm sure he will. Morgan poured Rebecca a coffee and set the mug in front of her. I have to learn about the Amish now. Can you teach me? Morgan asked. 
Rebecca laughed. So it's like that, is it? You really like him just from seeing him once before you've even talked to him? Although Rebecca was laughing at young love, she knew that love could happen just in that way. She'd immediately felt something with Jeremiah as soon as she saw him and had fallen in love with Colin at first sight. Love at first sight was a cliché to most people, yet Rebecca knew that it could be very, very real. Tingles had run down Rebecca's body while she had listened to her speak of Jacob. Morgan pursed her lips and said, Yes? Or should I say yeah? Rebecca noticed that Morgan's face was glowing brightly. Would you like to visit Kate on Saturday? Kate has four young children and you can see for yourself just what an Amish household is like. She's also Jacob's sister, so you'll have to behave yourself. I'd love that, Rebecca. Thank you so much. I wonder if he'll be there. Chapter 8 Truly my soul waiteth upon God. From him cometh my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. Psalm 62, 1, 2 Rebecca made no more mention of Morgan at work. It still worried Rebecca that Morgan's parents had mentioned all those terrible things about Morgan. But so far, apart from a defiant attitude, Rebecca had seen no evidence of the things that they had spoken of. The few times that Sarah and Kate had asked about Morgan, Rebecca had just said that she was coming along nicely. On Saturday morning, Jeremiah called for Rebecca and Morgan in his buggy. Oh, great. We get to go in the buggy again. Morgan ran to Jeremiah. Hello, Jeremiah. Um, Mr. Troyer, can I steer the horse? She asked. Jeremiah shook his head. No. His tone was sharp and firm. Why not? Rebecca rolled her eyes. Why can't she learn to leave things be? He asked. Jeremiah opened the doors for Rebecca and Morgan. Rebecca said, It's very dangerous in all the traffic around these parts. Drivers of the cars have no idea what they should and shouldn't do around buggies or horses. Sometimes they get too close and spook the horse. Sometimes they sound their horns and expect that the buggies can go as fast as the cars. Morgan made herself comfortable in the back seat. Okay, just asking. As Jeremiah got back in the driver's seat, he took hold of the reins and said, I might let you have a little try when we get onto a quieter road. Ooh, goody. Morgan clapped her hands. Rebecca thought it a huge step forward that Jeremiah was going to let Morgan have a drive of the buggy. I hear you're doing very well in the store, Morgan, Jeremiah said. Yes, I'm doing very well. They said I was the best employee they ever had. Jeremiah gave a little chuckle. Keep up the good work then, he replied. Fifteen minutes later, they arrived at Kate's house. Once they got out of the buggy, Morgan whispered to Rebecca, Aren't the Amish supposed to be poor? This doesn't look like a poor house. Rebecca whispered back, Amish aren't meant to be poor. I suppose some are, but not all. As soon as Jeremiah finished tending to the horse, they all walked toward the house. Jeremiah said, I think I can smell freshly baked cakes. Rebecca laughed. She knew you were coming. Once they reached the front door, they heard Kate call for them to come in. They all walked in to find Kate with her baby boy on one hip and three small girls hanging onto her skirt. After Rebecca introduced everyone, Morgan leaned down to the eye level of the girls and started talking to them. Rebecca could see that the children had taken to her immediately. The older one, Hannah, held her hand and took her to the other room while the two smaller girls followed behind. They are so cute, Kate, and they're growing so fast, Rebecca said. Jeremiah was busy looking around. Is Benjamin working today? he asked. Yeah, but he decided to finish early when he heard you would be here. He shouldn't be much longer. Until then, you might have to talk to us women folk, Kate replied. Kate and Rebecca laughed. I've got some blueberry cake I've just finished baking. Kate put the baby in the high chair at the kitchen table and motioned for Rebecca and Jeremiah to sit down. Do you want some help, Kate? Rebecca asked. No. Do you both have coffee or would you like some lemon tea? Kate asked. Both Jeremiah and Rebecca decided to have some hot lemon tea, rather than the coffee that they usually had. You could feed Benjamin his cereal if you were brave enough, Rebecca. He makes a real mess, Kate told her. Rebecca looked at chubby Benjamin in his high chair, and he smiled up at her, a large toothless grin. I will try and feed him. Rebecca picked up the spoon in the cereal bowl and put it to the baby's mouth. 
As quick as a flash, the baby brought up his little fist and sent the spoonful of cereal flying through the air. Oh, did you see that? He can't be too hungry then, Jeremiah said as he laughed. Kate had turned her attention from making the tea and caught a glimpse of what Benjamin had done. Don't worry about it, Rebecca. I'll just give him some toast to chew on. That should keep him quiet. Kate returned to the table with tea and handed the baby a crust of toast. What about that cake you promised me? Jeremiah asked. Kate laughed. Oh, sorry, Jeremiah. I had it over there to bring over. Kate fetched the cake and placed it in front of Jeremiah. There were six generous slices of blueberry cake on the plate. I most likely couldn't eat it all, he replied. I think you probably could, Rebecca said, still envious that he could eat anything and still have a solid, flat stomach. Kate placed some other plates on the table and took a piece of blueberry cake for herself. After Jeremiah had finished his first mouthful of cake, he said, You're a mighty fine cook, Kate. Kate nodded her head and smiled. Thank you. Rebecca decided that she should get some information about Jacob before Morgan came back into the room. So how is Jacob doing? I haven't heard you mention him in a while. He's well. He helps Benjamin a lot when he's not helping Dad, that is. That might get confusing when the baby grows to have the same name as his dad, Jeremiah said as he pushed the plate of cake a little further into the center of the table. That's what I said to Benjamin, but I chose the three girls' names, and Benjamin said it was his turn to name the next baby. His father's name was Benjamin too, so he is the third generation Benjamin Yoder. Kate smoothed the ten-month-old baby's head with her hand. The way the conversation had turned, Rebecca found it hard to turn the subject back to Jacob without sounding like she was deliberately trying to solicit information, which, of course, she was. She desperately wanted to ask whether Jacob had ever courted a girl. However, she did not want Kate to think that she was trying to matchmake. She knew Jacob was a lovely young man and would be a stabilizing influence on Morgan. It would be a good thing for Morgan to have a nice boyfriend. It was at that moment Rebecca felt a little maternal for the first time in her life. Although she had often felt like a mother to Kate, Kate had never needed caring for or direction, and Morgan needed both of those things. It was as if Rebecca had become a mother hen and was looking after her little chick. Unfortunately for Rebecca, no further mention was made of Jacob, nor was she able to find a smooth way to bring Jacob back into the conversation. Morgan is keeping those children very quiet. I'll just have a peek and see what they're doing. Kate left the baby boy in the high chair and crept into the next room to see what her other children were doing with Morgan. Kate came back into the kitchen. Looks like she's telling them a story. Kate seemed quite pleased, but Rebecca was a little worried about what kind of story Morgan was telling the children. She hoped Morgan wasn't telling them of anything that would give them nightmares like witches, goblins, or even vampires. Chapter 9 Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Matthew 6.30 As they drove in Jeremiah's buggy away from Kate's place, Rebecca asked Morgan, So what did you think of a real Amish home? I loved it. You can feel the peace and the love and the children are so happy, she replied. That's what homes are supposed to be, Jeremiah said. Rebecca wondered just how happy Jeremiah had been when his wife was alive, and his children were still young. He never talked about his late wife. Then again, Rebecca never spoke about Colin with him either. She wondered if Jeremiah still held pain in his heart, like she did for Colin. Rebecca had often prayed for God to take that pain away, and then Jeremiah had come into her life. Jeremiah had brought love and companionship into her life. But the pain of losing Colin was a pain that Rebecca realized would never leave her. Rebecca found that just because she loved Jeremiah that did not lessen the love she still had for her late husband Colin. She never thought that she would or could love another man, but Jeremiah and God had opened her heart to let the love flow in. As Rebecca turned back around, she noticed Jeremiah's strong hands holding the reins and admired his long, lean fingers. Can we visit again soon? Morgan asked. Rebecca turned to face Morgan, who was sitting in the back seat. Yeah, I suppose we can, but not too soon. Rebecca glanced at Jeremiah's face and noticed that the dappled sunlight from the trees overhead 
passed over his face in a way that highlighted his handsome features. Morgan spoke again. Jeremiah, I mean, Mr. Troyer, before we get into traffic, can I have a turn at driving the buggy? I can't see any cars on this road. Jeremiah smiled a little and looked over at Morgan. I know a quiet little road that should be safe. It's just up here, he said. Oh, good. Thanks, Mr. Troyer. Once Jeremiah was in the quiet street, he pulled the buggy off the road. I won't teach you about the traffic rules. For today, I'll just show you a few of the basic things. Rebecca and Morgan swapped places so Morgan could sit in the front next to Jeremiah. Once you have got a hold of the reins, you must never let go of them. Keep them in your hands at all times, he told her. Got it. Morgan gave a sharp nod of her head. Slowly take up the slack of the reins so you feel you have contact with the horse's mouth, but don't pull on them. The whip should be held in the right hand and slightly tilted to the left. Mind you, you never need use the whip. As soon as the horse feels you go to use it or seize it, he will know what that means. A good buggy horse will anyway. Okay, I've got it. Now can I have my turn? Jeremiah put one long finger up in front of Morgan's face. No, Morgan. You must listen and learn first. Now repeat what I have just told you so I know that you've been listening, he said. Morgan repeated all that she had been told, almost word for word. Rebecca was surprised that Morgan had been paying such close attention. She also knew that was something that would please Jeremiah. Good. Now place your feet here. Jeremiah stamped his feet on the footboard so Morgan could see where to put them. Yes, okay. Then hold the reins between these two fingers. Jeremiah held up his index and third finger. Now you take a turn at holding the reins correctly. Morgan took hold of the reins. Like this? Yeah, exactly. It's important not to put too much pressure on the reins, but it's good to gently feel that you are connected to the horse's mouth. I'm most likely repeating myself, but it takes a while to get used to everything, he told her. Jeremiah made a slight adjustment to the angle of Morgan's hands. Now, when I want him to walk, I call out step up and he goes forward. When I want him to stop, I just give slight pressure on the reins. Okay, I understand. Can I have a go now? Morgan peered eagerly into Jeremiah's face. Yeah, but we'll just go a little way today, he told her. Morgan and Jeremiah got out of the buggy and swapped places. Morgan successfully took the horse half a mile up the quiet, tree-lined country road. Jeremiah raised his hand. Very good. Now gentle pressure on the reins, so he'll know to stop. Like this. The horse came to a stop. Perfect. That was very good and you listened to everything I said. Morgan turned to Jeremiah. Can I take him faster or into some traffic? Jeremiah shook his head. No, there are traffic rules to learn and it's far too dangerous for a beginner. I'll give you some more practice before we hit the roads or go faster, he said. Jeremiah's right. That's enough for one day, Morgan. Rebecca was a little frightened at the thought of heading into traffic with Morgan behind the reins, with her impulsive nature. Just as Jeremiah had his hand on the door of the buggy to change places with Morgan, Morgan let out an almighty scream. Yee-haw! Step up! Rebecca's heart froze as she heard the scream and had looked up immediately in time to see the long whip waving in the air. The horse took off with the buggy and with the three of them in it. It seemed to Rebecca that Morgan had hit the horse with the whip and screamed so the horse would gallop, and that is exactly what the horse did. Rebecca shut her eyes tightly and clung to the side of the buggy as if she had just entered some kind of nightmare. What are you doing? Jeremiah's voice boomed as he yelled and grabbed the reins from Morgan. He managed to pull the horse off to the side of road. He turned to Morgan once they came to a complete stop. Why did you do that? I can't trust you at all. I don't believe you just did that, he said. Jeremiah's face was beet red with anger. You don't need to yell. I just wanted to show you that I could handle going faster, and I could, until you stopped me. Rebecca knew that this was not a good step forward for Jeremiah and Morgan's relationship. She had never seen Jeremiah this angry, nor had she ever heard him raise his voice like that. And why wouldn't I stop you? You don't know what you're doing at all, and it could have been very dangerous, he said. Jeremiah, with the reins clenched in one hand, yelled at Morgan, Get out! Morgan obeyed quickly. Now get in the back, he ordered. 
Rebecca promptly got out of the back seat and into the front passenger seat while Morgan sat in the back. Jeremiah started the buggy again at a slow pace. Rebecca remained silent, as she did not know what to say to smooth the tense situation. She wanted to reprimand Morgan. But Jeremiah was doing enough of that for the two of them. I can't believe you just did that. I trusted you with my horse and my buggy. I would have been quite happy to teach you to drive it properly, but not now. Never again, he said. Jeremiah's face was still red, and even the tops of his ears had turned red to match his face. I just wanted to show you, that's all. Morgan's words were spoken quietly. Show me what? All you showed me is that you can't follow instructions and you can't be trusted. His words were spat angrily. The rest of the trip to Rebecca's house was spent in silence. When they reached the house, Morgan got out and went into the house without saying a word to Jeremiah. Rebecca felt she should call her back and make her say goodbye to Jeremiah and thank him for taking them to Kate's house. But reconsidered. If she called her back, that would be treating her as a young child. And she wasn't a young child. She was a young adult. She should know the proper way to behave. Rebecca saw that Jeremiah was still fuming with anger. I'm sorry, Jeremiah. Jeremiah shook his head. Are you coming in? Rebecca asked. Normally, Jeremiah would have stayed for dinner, but today she did not think he would want to be near Morgan after what had just happened. No, I'll be going home, he announced. Rebecca stood near the buggy and wanted to plead with him to stay, but knew it would be best if he went away and cooled his temper down. I'm sorry about what just happened. I had no idea she would do anything so silly. It's not your fault, he replied. There was silence between them for a moment until Jeremiah said, I think you should tell her to be on her way. Rebecca slung her handbag over her shoulder. What, like to leave the house? You're not her mother. Why do you need all this aggravation? She's out of control. You don't owe her anything. She's practically a stranger to you, he said. The thought of telling Morgan to go did not sit right with Rebecca. I can't. Where would she go? Jeremiah gave a shrug of his shoulders and turned his gaze straight ahead. She's a grown woman. She's not a child. She can look after herself. Rebecca knew the look on Jeremiah's face. It was his look of determination. It was clear that nothing she could say would change his mind. She's only 18. 18 is a grown woman. If she was Amish, she would likely be married by now and running a household, he told her. Yes, but she's not Amish, Rebecca thought. Jeremiah looked at Rebecca, his face red and his eyes blazing. She just rudely walked away and did not even acknowledge me, as if I were the one in the wrong. Yes, that was rude, but I think she's very upset. Jeremiah got out of the buggy and walked over to Rebecca and put his hands on her shoulders. You know the way I feel about you? he asked. Rebecca nodded. I still want to marry you, but please understand I cannot visit you while Morgan is in your house. I think she is rude and I think she has no place here, he told her. I wonder if he's really telling me that I have to choose between the two of them, Rebecca thought. She grabbed Jeremiah's hand that was on her shoulder. Oh, Jeremiah, no. Yeah, I'm too old for nonsense and that girl just seems like trouble, he said. Jeremiah kissed Rebecca on the forehead, got back in his gray buggy and drove away. Rebecca choked back tears as she stood on the side of the street outside her house and watched his buggy disappear into the distance. Chapter 10 If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? Psalm 130 3 Once Rebecca was inside the safety of her home, she went in search of Morgan. She had to tell her exactly what she thought of her behavior. She found Morgan on her bed, crying. I can't reprimand her now. Not now, with her crying floods of tears. Rebecca's heart softened as she sat on the edge of Morgan's bed. He hates me now, Rebecca, Morgan managed to say through her tears. I just wanted to show him how good I was, that I could drive the buggy. No one can drive a buggy until they are shown, Rebecca said. Rebecca knew that Jeremiah was starting to warm to Morgan before she had pulled that stunt. Now Rebecca was not sure if things between them could ever be mended. Jeremiah had once told Rebecca that he often wished for another child, when the boys were younger, a girl. She had seen a glimpse of the fatherly side of Jeremiah as he handed over the reins. Morgan sat up and wiped her eyes. Has he gone? 
Yeah, he went home. Jeremiah was extremely angry over his trust in Morgan being abused. He had trusted Morgan with his horse and with his buggy, and she threw that trust straight back into his face. Initially, he had been pleased to show another person how to drive the buggy. His mind had even been drawn to the times that he had taught Paul and Eli to drive a buggy. It wasn't that she had just defied him. It was also very dangerous. If his horse hadn't been so well-trained, he could have spooked or bolted into a car, or maybe another buggy. Jeremiah's boys had always been well-behaved when they were youngsters, especially around the livestock. Jeremiah had not experienced such a lack of respect from anyone as he had just experienced with Morgan. Why didn't Rebecca speak up and back me up? Maybe I should have asked Rebecca why she remained silent when Morgan did that terrible thing. It was clear to Jeremiah that Rebecca had different ideas to him about what was right and what was wrong. Their standards were different. One thing was clear to Jeremiah, and that was that Rebecca and he could not get married while Morgan was in Rebecca's life. He knew that Morgan would create too many arguments between them. Arguments were not something Jeremiah wished to have in the last half of his years. He craved to live a quiet and simple life, preferably with Rebecca by his side. Rebecca had not heard from Jeremiah in nearly two days, which was not entirely unusual, but after what had happened she would have liked to have heard from him sooner. She needed reassurance that their relationship would not suffer over having Morgan at her house. Rebecca went to work hoping Jeremiah may call into her store around lunchtime, as he often did. Kate spoke, suddenly jolting Rebecca from her daydreams. Morgan seems such a lovely girl and she's so good with the children. Do you know that she told them Bible stories? Rebecca looked up from the fabric she was just about to cut. Really? I had no idea that she would even know any Bible stories. What did she tell them? She told them about Daniel in the lion's den. I know because Hannah asked Benjamin to tell her that one when he put her to bed. She said that Morgan told her about Daniel. Rebecca had never known any of Colin's relatives to attend church of any kind. Maybe Morgan did go to church after all, or heard the stories at school, Rebecca thought. She certainly doesn't seem like a bad girl, Kate said. Rebecca was glad to have someone reinforce her opinion of Morgan. She wasn't a bad girl at all. No, I don't think she is a bad girl. Rebecca was tempted to ask about Kate's brother, Jacob, but it would be too obvious to bring him up now that they had been speaking about Morgan. Soon after Morgan's arrival to her house, Rebecca had put her hidden cash in the bank, and the little jewelry she owned was now sitting safely in a deposit box, just in case the stories about Morgan stealing were true. Rebecca had gotten home early again, so she could be home when Morgan arrived home. Morgan stormed into the kitchen like a tornado. Aunt Rebecca, he came in again today. Rebecca was in the kitchen cutting vegetables for dinner, with her mind on Jeremiah. He hadn't come into her store that day like she hoped that he would. Who came in? Morgan sat at the dining room table. The boy I showed you the photo of, on my cell phone, Jacob. Did he talk to you? Morgan was touching her cell phone while she was speaking to Rebecca. Yes, he talked to me. He asked me if I want to go on a buggy ride sometime. He what? A buggy ride? Rebecca could see that Morgan was concentrating on the phone more than listening to her words. Morgan, put that phone away, please, while you're speaking to me. Morgan looked up. I'm multitasking. It's okay. I can do two things at once. It's not okay. Put it away. Morgan popped the phone in her bag. Why do you seem so shocked about a buggy ride? Rebecca wondered if she should tell Morgan the implication of a buggy ride. If Morgan were an Amish girl, a buggy ride would be like a date. But since Morgan was English, Rebecca did not know if that was Jacob's intention. She guessed it most likely was. Oh, nothing. So what did you say? Morgan drummed her fingertips on the table. I said yes, obviously. Rebecca took a deep breath. Morgan, please don't speak to me in that tone of voice. What tone? That's just how I speak, Morgan replied. No, it is not. Sometimes you speak very nicely and sometimes you speak rudely. I don't like it when you speak rudely like you just did. Morgan lowered her head slightly. Sorry, Aunt Rebecca, I mean, Rebecca. Rebecca sighed. Call me Aunt Rebecca if you wish. Morgan stood up quickly. Do you want some help with cutting the vegetables? Rebecca nearly said no, but then reconsidered. Yeah, you can cut these. Rebecca pushed the carrots toward her. So when is this buggy ride going to take place? 
Morgan sat down at the table again, placing the carrots to be chopped in front of her. He's coming to pick me up from here tomorrow. Rebecca realized that she would be at work tomorrow, which would leave Morgan the run of the house since she had tomorrow off. Morgan chopped the carrots very carefully and precisely into very tiny pieces. Rebecca resisted the urge to show her how to cut the carrots correctly and diverted her mind to the boy who Morgan liked and the buggy ride. Okay, these are things you must know. Morgan stopped cutting the carrots and looked up, fixing her eyes intently on Rebecca. There's to be no kissing. Morgan opened her mouth as if she were in shock. Really? Why not? Rebecca began peeling the potatoes. If you kiss him, then he'll have no respect for you. Morgan gave a little snigger and rolled her eyes. Rebecca placed the knife she was holding on the table. If you want to catch this boy's heart, you must do everything I say. I know the Amish and you don't, all right? Rebecca realized that she was wagging her finger at Morgan while she was speaking. Rebecca swallowed hard. She had not liked it when her mother wagged her finger in her face and now she was doing the very same thing to someone else. Morgan nodded. Rebecca quickly made her hands busy by picking the knife back up. So as I said, you must not kiss him. You must not have him in this house, unless there is also someone else in this house, which there won't be so. Don't invite him in. Rebecca figured that she had better explain herself as Morgan was looking at her blankly. Reputation is everything. It does not look good for a young man and a young girl to be alone in a house. Morgan tipped her head back. Oh, I see. So Amish don't sleep together before they are married? Goodness me, no. Rebecca picked up a magazine that she was going to use to collect the vegetable scraps and started fanning her hot flashes. Of course not. So you and Jeremiah haven't. Rebecca tossed the magazine down on the table. Morgan, I'll not discuss those kinds of things with you. Morgan laughed. Okay, tell me more about what I should do and shouldn't do. Rebecca continued to fan her hot face. No swearing, cursing, saying rude things about people. Be polite at all times. No nudity, kissing, and please cover up that tattoo. You don't want to shock him away before you've got to know him. Morgan squirmed in the chair. What's wrong with my tattoo? My tattoo is an expression of who I am. Rebecca shook her head as she tried to understand what the young girl was saying. So, you are a Chinese dragon? Morgan laughed hard. You're so funny. Rebecca just did not understand Morgan at all. How could a Chinese dragon be an expression of who she was? Morgan raised her sleeve and stared adoringly at her tattoo. I'm going to get more tattoos, too. No, please don't. The idea of more tattoos was making Rebecca's hot flash worse, so she fanned her face a little harder. You just don't like them because you're not young anymore. You don't understand young people. All young people have tattoos nowadays. Rebecca thought hard, but couldn't think of anyone she knew who had a tattoo. She'd only seen them on people she didn't know. Morgan, you are the only person I know who has a tattoo. People might have tattoos in Canada, but not around these parts. Morgan just shrugged her shoulders. Rebecca had heard of the generation gap, and now she knew what it was. She had never noticed such a gap with her friends, Sarah or Kate, and she was a good 30 years older than they were. Anyway, tattoos aside, where was I? Oh yes, now the Amish have an old-fashioned sort of life. They like to live a plain and simple life. They mostly have a lot of children. The wife cooks and looks after the home while the husband works on the farm. These days, though, a lot of women work outside of the home. Like Kate does? Morgan picked up the knife and chopped the last carrot into small pieces. That's right. Once all the carrots had been sliced, Morgan pushed the chopping board toward Rebecca. Eli's told me quite a bit about how the Amish live. Sometimes we talk a little when there are no customers about. Oh, that's good so you know a little bit more than I thought. Morgan pushed her hair behind her ears. Yes, I suppose I do. Morgan, that reminds me. How did you hear about the stories that you told Kate's girls? Mom made me go to church until I was 10. Then I said that I didn't want to go anymore. Rebecca turned her back on Morgan to fill a saucepan with water for the vegetables. You didn't enjoy it? No, I enjoyed it when I was little because they used to give us candy. But when I grew older, I didn't like it anymore. I believe in God, though. Rebecca nearly dropped the saucepan of water when she heard that Morgan believed in God. Do you? Yes. Morgan nodded her head quite vigorously. Why do you look surprised? I suppose I'm just used to the Amish ways. 
Rebecca reprimanded herself for looking shocked. She herself believed in God even though she was not officially back within the Amish community. Maybe Morgan believes in the existence of God, but has not accepted him into her life, Rebecca thought. Either way, Rebecca was pleased that Morgan believed in God. Chapter 11 And that ye study to be quiet and to do your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. 1. Thessalonians 4.11 Another day had gone by and there was still no sign of Jeremiah. He hadn't called to Rebecca's house, he hadn't called to her store, and he hadn't called her from his phone in the shanty outside his house. Rebecca walked home from her store, anxious to hear how Morgan had gone on the buggy ride with Jacob. Morgan met her at the front door. Come in, come in, I can't wait to tell you what happened. All right, just let me put my things away. Let's talk in the kitchen. Rebecca put her bag and coat in her bedroom and placed her pink, comfy slippers on her feet. Her feet were always a little sore from the walks home from work. Hot lemon tea? Rebecca heard Morgan call out. Yes, please, with a spoonful of honey. Rebecca realized how nice it was to have someone else in the house. She no longer had to come home to an empty house. Rebecca did have to admit that there was something engaging about Morgan. Yes, she was impulsive. Yes, she was silly at times but she had a lively spark about her, which was most likable. Rebecca sat down at the kitchen table, and Morgan placed a cup of tea in front of her. Thank you. Now tell me everything. Oh, he's so wonderful. Morgan clasped her hands to her heart. He's a real gentleman. He's so polite. Only thing is, he speaks a bit funny, a bit like Jeremiah. Rebecca's heart sank a little at the mention of Jeremiah, but at the same time, she gave a little giggle at Morgan thinking they spoke funny. That's because the Amish also speak Pennsylvania Dutch as well as English. Yeah, I know that. Anyway, we drove all around and talked and talked. He pulled up the buggy and we went for a walk in the fields. He asked so many questions and I told him all about myself. Rebecca suddenly realized she should have told Morgan to ask the questions. Was it really a good idea for Jacob to know all about Morgan? So has he asked you out again? No, but I'm sure he will. I know he had a great time too. Rebecca was a little concerned and hoped that Jacob would not break Morgan's heart. That's good. I'm happy for you. Just don't get your hopes up too high. What do you mean? Morgan asked. I mean that he is Amish and you are not. There was no other way around it but to spell it out loud and clear to Morgan. Amish just don't marry or date people who aren't Amish. Yes, they do. I just went on a date with him and I'm not Amish. Rebecca took a mouthful of tea and tried to think of another way to say what she had just said. But they don't marry outside. For instance, if he were to marry you, then he would have to leave the Amish, leave his family, and leave the community. Well, he has to leave home sometime, doesn't he? Rebecca picked up a teaspoon and stirred her tea to dissolve the honey a little more. Amish are different. They have their own community and family is everything to them. Sometimes the young marrieds live with their parents until they can afford their own place. Oh, that would be horrible. Morgan popped two spoonfuls of honey in her tea and sat opposite Rebecca. What if I went Amish? Rebecca laughed. You don't just go Amish. Morgan laughed too. Well, I mean, could I turn into an Amish person? You're going back to being an Amish person, aren't you? Yes, I am. I hope, she thought, still worried about not hearing from Jeremiah for so long. You have to believe in God and give your life to him and get baptized into the faith. Then you have to be happy to live in an old-fashioned way. No cell phones, no computers, no electricity, and some homes don't even have toilets inside. Morgan glanced at her cell phone, which was on the table next to her tea. I don't think I could do without my cell phone. It's not easy being Amish. Not after you've been English all your life, I would imagine. Morgan picked up her phone and started looking at something on it. So he'd be picking an Amish girl to marry and wouldn't think about marrying someone like me? Is that what you were saying? Rebecca took a deep breath. Morgan, please don't look at your cell phone while we're talking. Morgan put the phone down and pushed it along the table. That's better. I'm saying these things because I don't want you to get your hopes up. Morgan stared across at Rebecca and spoke firmly. No, it's not like that, Rebecca. We had a real connection. I know he feels the same way about me. Rebecca put her head down and drank her tea. It's never easy to tell Morgan anything. 
It's as if she always thinks that she knows better, just like when she thought she knew how to drive Jeremiah's buggy. Rebecca hoped it would not come down to her having to choose between Colin's niece and the man whom she loved. She loved Jeremiah with all that was within her, but she also knew that she would never be able to put Morgan out into the street with nowhere to go and no one to turn to. She just couldn't. Jeremiah sat on his porch. Even though it had only been days, it seemed like weeks had passed since he had seen Rebecca. He wished she would have made the effort to come to his house to see him so that they could talk. Wasn't he worth the time to at least talk about things? She could have come to his place by taxi. She had done that many times before. He looked up the driveway hoping to see a taxi, as he had done many times over the past few days. Surely Rebecca can see that Morgan is only using her? She has defied and been disobedient to her own parents and then lands at Rebecca's house and thinks she can do as she wishes. Rebecca is too soft to see through her cunning ways. Jeremiah was worried what the future may bring. He wanted more than anything to grow old with Rebecca and to look after her. But Morgan had come along just in time to ruin his plans. Rebecca was considering Morgan first and putting him in their marriage second. Why does nothing go easy for me, Lord? Jeremiah wondered if he was being too harsh with expecting Rebecca to tell Morgan to leave. She's 18, a capable adult more than clever enough to look after herself. She's got a bright personality and even talked Eli into giving her a part-time job. No, I know I'm right on this one. Rebecca will have to see that I'm right. I will give her some time alone to think about things. Hopefully she will make the right decision, Jeremiah thought. What if he's sick and that's why he hasn't come to see me or hasn't called? No, he's stubborn. He'll be waiting for me to come to my senses and agree with his way of thinking. Rebecca considered that stubbornness was one of Jeremiah's worst traits. Rebecca was supposed to be working, but today all her thoughts were on Jeremiah. That was, until the bell over the door of her store rang. Morgan, have you finished work early? As Rebecca walked toward Morgan, she could see that something was wrong. What's happened? Money is missing at work and they are blaming me. Morgan's bottom lip quivered and tears came to her eyes. Come into the back room and you can tell me what happened. I'll make you a nice cup of coffee. Rebecca ushered Morgan into the back room, pleased that both Kate and Sarah were not working that day. Rebecca placed a back in Ten Min's sign on the door and hurried back to Morgan. Now tell me exactly what happened. Morgan began to cry. It's happening all over again, just like the last job. Rebecca handed Morgan a tissue. How did money go missing? Morgan wiped her eyes and straightened her shoulders. They had all the money out of the safe ready to do the weekly banking. Then they counted it out and Eli said that there was 3,000 missing. So why do they think that you took it? Rebecca felt sorry for Morgan and at the same time felt sorry for herself. Jeremiah would eventually find out about this, and that would not be good. They didn't say as much. But I knew they thought it was me, so I grabbed my things and left. More tears came to Morgan's eyes. Rebecca pulled two tissues from the tissue box and handed them to Morgan. What? Why? You just walked out? Morgan cried much harder, and Rebecca put her arm around her. There, there. We'll sort this out. They won't believe me, Rebecca. They won't. They didn't at my last job, and they won't believe me at this job. Morgan blew her nose. I don't know why people don't trust me, but they don't. That's nonsense. Don't be silly. I'll call them, and we'll sort it out. Rebecca looked up and saw that a customer was trying to get through the locked door. Looks like I'll have to serve this customer first. Then I'll call Eli, okay? Morgan had her eyes covered by two tissues and was still crying, so Rebecca patted her on the shoulder. Back soon. Once the customer had gone, Rebecca picked up the phone and called Eli. Eli said that he didn't know why Morgan had suddenly run out. Rebecca explained to him that she thought she was going to be accused of taking the missing money. As it turned out, the missing money was found at the back of the safe, and they had never thought that Morgan had taken it. See, so they never thought you took it at all. Rebecca put her arm around Morgan and gave her a little squeeze. Morgan stopped crying and started sniffing. Oh, I'm so embarrassed now. I'll never be able to go back there. Why not? It was just a misunderstanding. I ran out. I'll feel like such a fool if I go back. Oh, I'm so embarrassed. They must think that I'm such an idiot. 
Morgan saw a mirror on the side of the wall and stood up to examine her tear-drenched face. Oh, I look awful. No, you don't at all, and you won't look a fool if you go back. They think you are doing a good job. Morgan spun around to face Rebecca. Really? Rebecca nodded enthusiastically. Couldn't I work here with you? It looks like so much fun. We could work together. Wouldn't you like that? No. The words escaped Rebecca's mouth before she could catch them. Rebecca regretted sounding so definite. She did not want to sound like she was giving the poor girl more rejection. I have no room for anyone else. I already have two girls working for me and there's no more work. Morgan blew her nose again. I'll go back with you if you like and we can speak to them together. The last thing Rebecca wanted was to have Morgan working for her, especially since she showed she could not listen to instruction. That would be worse. It would look like I'm a child with my mother speaking for me or something. I'd rather get a job somewhere else, Morgan said. That makes no sense, Morgan. You've got a good job there and they're not easy to come by, Rebecca replied. I can get jobs easily. Look how easy I got that job. It was my first day here in Lancaster County. That's probably only because they knew me, though. Rebecca didn't like to say it so bluntly, but she did want the girl to face reality. Jobs were not that easy to come by, particularly with no references and particularly when the employer from the tattoo shop had accused her of stealing. No more nonsense. If you want to stay at my house, you will have to swallow your pride and go back to the Saddlers. Morgan covered her face with both her hands. I'm so embarrassed. They'll wonder why I ran off. They'll wonder why I thought that they thought I took the money. Tell them. Tell them the truth. Morgan looked up and opened her mouth. I can't tell them the truth. Why not? Rebecca asked. You didn't take the money at the tattoo place, so why not tell them? Morgan was silent for a while. I suppose I could tell them the truth. They really like me. That would explain why I ran off so quickly as well. There you go. Problem solved. Morgan stood to her feet and hugged Rebecca tightly. You're a genius. A true genius. Chapter 12 And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Ephesians 4.32 Rebecca shut her store a little early that day so they could make it to the saddlers before they closed. Rebecca sat with Morgan in Eli's office while Morgan told Eli the whole story of what had happened in her previous job. As soon as he heard what Morgan had to say, Eli leaned back in his chair. I'm glad you told me, Morgan, he said. Morgan's face brightened. But, Eli continued, it's one thing to think that everyone thought that you took the money and a very different thing to run out and leave the store unattended, he said. Rebecca did not think she was going to like the next thing that would come out of Eli's mouth. She also noticed that Morgan was squirming uncomfortably in her chair. Eli looked directly at Morgan. We didn't know where you had gone. We actually didn't know you had gone at all until a customer rang the bell for attendance. Eli picked up a pencil and tapped it on his desk while he held Morgan's gaze. I'm afraid we'll have to let you go, he told her. Morgan immediately sat at the very edge of her seat. What do you mean? I told you the truth, she said. Morgan, it's not about you having been accused of stealing in the past or anything like that. It's the fact that you left the store unattended. We could have had a lot of stock stolen. Besides that, people come into a store to be served, not to wander around an empty store. Morgan shot a glare at Rebecca. Rebecca knew that Morgan was thinking it's your entire fault. Morgan looked back to Eli. You were out the back. It wasn't an empty store. Eli disregarded her comments. You are aware that you were employed on a trial basis, aren't you? He asked. Yes, she replied. I'm afraid things just didn't work out, he said as he rose to his feet. Morgan stood up and said, What if I promise not to do it again? Eli just shook his head. Norell will have a check ready for you on your way out. We'll pay you through to the end of the week, he told her. Rebecca stood up beside Morgan. Thank you for giving her the opportunity, Eli. Eli smiled and tipped his head to Rebecca. The sun was very low in the sky as they walked the short distance home. Morgan turned to Rebecca and said, I guess the truth isn't always the best way. You can't live your life with a lie, Rebecca said. Anyway, it was the running away, leaving the store unattended, that he was upset about. 
Rebecca wanted to ask Morgan what she intended to do now. The longer Morgan was without a job, the more she would be dependent on Rebecca, and that would delay Rebecca's wedding plans. Thanks for helping me, Rebecca. Anyway, I didn't want to work at a Sadler's for the rest of my life. Morgan's head hung low and her feet almost dragged the ground as she walked. Rebecca put her arm around Morgan's shoulders. Didn't you say that you wanted to own a Sadler's? Yeah, but not now. It was a bit boring anyway, Morgan replied. That's fine. You don't have to work there for the rest of your life, but you do have to work somewhere. That was as good a place as any for the time being. Rebecca regretted adding that last bit. She didn't want to rub salt in Morgan's wounds. Morgan flung her head back and looked up at the sky. I don't really know what I want to do. I do think I'd like to be a realtor. That's what I really want to do. Why don't you find out what's involved to become one? Rebecca asked. Okay, I will. Rebecca wasn't pleased for the drama that Morgan had just been through, but she was pleased for the distraction, which caused her to stop worrying over Jeremiah's absence. As he did most evenings, Jeremiah was sitting on his porch watching the sun go down, with a cup of hot tea in hand. He rose to his feet as he saw Eli's car turn into his driveway. What brings you here? Jeremiah asked. He rarely had unannounced visits from his sons these days. They both were so busy with their lives. Just thought I'd come and visit my old dad, Eli replied. Jeremiah sat back down in the chair and patted the one next to him. Well, I'm glad you're here, he told his son. Eli sat on the edge of the chair. Do you want a coffee, or I could fix you some hot tea? No, I've only called in quickly on my way home, Eli replied. Jeremiah knew that Eli had something on his mind by the way he was moving in the chair and scratching his head in a nervous gesture. Out with it. What's on your mind? The new girl at work, Eli said. Morgan? Jeremiah asked. Eli nodded. What is it? We had... Well, we thought we had some money missing when we went to do the banking. Anyway, next thing we know is that Morgan's nowhere to be found. She had run out of the store and didn't come back. Jeremiah put his hand to his chin, as he did when he was thinking things through. Did you find the missing money? Yes, it had gone to the back shelf of the safe somehow. Anyhow, long story short, turns out that we found out that Morgan had been accused of stealing in another job that she had. Jeremiah put his elbow on the arm of the chair and rested his chin on his knuckles. Didn't you call her references before you hired her? He asked Eli. No, I never bother with that sort of thing. Most resumes and references are made up anyway. They could put down a friend's phone number, and I'd never know the difference. Anyway, I just thought that you should know, he told his father. I see. Do you think Rebecca knows? Jeremiah asked. Eli sat a little further back in the chair. Yes, Rebecca came back with Morgan and was sitting next to her when she told me the whole story. I see. Well, I appreciate you telling me. Jeremiah was silent for a moment before he said, just because someone was accused of something doesn't mean they did it. Also, even if someone does something bad, they still deserve a second chance. Eli smiled. Thank you, Dad, that's what I thought you'd say, but I let her go. You fired her? Jeremiah asked. He was surprised that he would fire someone the first time they made a mistake. Yes, we can't have someone leaving the store unattended like that. You know how things can get stolen. Jeremiah looked out to the distant fields. You're the manager. You have to do what you see fit. Jeremiah knew that this would cause trouble between himself and Rebecca. Why did things never go smoothly for him? Jeremiah turned to his son. Now why don't you stay for a bit? Jeremiah missed the company of his boys. They used to visit quite a bit after they left the Amish, but now that they were both married, he hardly saw either of them. Jenny will be waiting for me. I'd better get going, he said. What? Waiting for you to cook the dinner? Jeremiah was not happy that his son managed the business and went home and did women's work while his wife had done nothing all day. Well, nothing that he knew of. She did not have a job. They had no children and they had people to clean for them and Eli did the cooking. Eli stood up and smiled widely. Now don't start on me now, old man. Jeremiah rose to his feet and slapped his son affectionately on the back of his shoulder and walked him to his car. As he watched his oldest son drive away, he blinked back tears that were brimming in his eyes. He missed the days when his sons were younger, 
they looked up to him and copied everything he did. Jeremiah had taken great delight in teaching them about farming and showing them how to look after all the animals. Now that they were older, they didn't want to spend much time with their old dad at all. He looked back to the two empty chairs on the porch and hoped that soon Rebecca would be sitting beside him as his wife. So much time had passed. He hoped he was doing the right thing by not contacting her. Or was he being a stubborn old man who was too rigid in his ways? Maybe he should contact Rebecca after what had just happened with Morgan. But that would mean drama, and Jeremiah did not like to be around drama or out-of-control teenagers. Jeremiah hoped that this whole new problem with Morgan being fired from his business was not going to come between Rebecca and him. He sat back in his chair and watched the sky slowly change from orange to gray. What would he do about the whole situation of Rebecca and Morgan? He decided to keep out of it and spend his time looking for a suitable house for Rebecca and himself to live in after they married. He would start looking for a place the very next day. As Morgan ran up the two steps and waited at the front door, Rebecca checked the letterbox. Rebecca hardly ever got letters, only bills, so she was surprised to see a handwritten envelope in her letterbox. She was even more surprised to see that the letter was addressed to Morgan. Morgan, there appears to be a letter here for you. Morgan ran to Rebecca and put her hands out. It must be from Jacob, Morgan said without being able to hide the excitement in her voice. Rebecca unlocked the door, and Morgan headed straight to her room with the letter still unopened. Rebecca went to her fluffy slippers. As usual, she fixed a hot tea, then headed straight to the garden. She was determined to sit quietly and enjoy the last light of the day in peace and quiet. It wasn't long before Morgan came bouncing out to the garden. Rebecca, Jacob has written me the most romantic letter of all time. Really, I'm glad. Rebecca sincerely hoped that Morgan would not get her hopes too high. Clearly, Jacob had a little crush on her, but could it lead anywhere? He wants me to go on another buggy ride with him this coming Saturday. Perfect, Rebecca thought. I might be able to spend some time with Jeremiah while Jacob is entertaining Morgan. Rebecca made up her mind that if she hadn't heard from Jeremiah by Saturday, that she would take a taxi to his place and see why he had not contacted her. Although she was pretty sure she knew why he was staying away from her. He did say that he would give her a little time alone to think. I wonder if he's missing me, Rebecca thought. Four o'clock Saturday afternoon rolled around quickly, and Jacob pulled up at Rebecca's house to take Morgan on the buggy ride. Rebecca stuck her head out of the front door and waved hello to Jacob. She knew Jacob quite well as he was the brother of the two girls who worked for her, Sarah and Kate. Jacob waved back while he waited in the buggy for Morgan. Bye, Rebecca, don't wait up. Morgan squeezed past Rebecca who was standing at the front door. Don't be late. Rebecca thought she should give some sort of guidance. Be home by nine or else. When Morgan was halfway between the buggy and the house, she just turned, smiled, and waved at Rebecca. Chapter 13 And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Romans 12, 2 When the buggy was out of sight, Rebecca remained in the doorway. She knew that Jacob was a good boy. She was grateful for that. Rebecca considered that she had the responsibility of being a parent to a teenager, but had no authority. It's not as if I can threaten to take her cell phone away or ground her. She hoped that Morgan would behave herself. Rebecca had buried the sadness of not being able to have children a long time ago, but she could not deny that she was having motherly feelings towards Morgan. Was this God's way of finally giving her a daughter after all this time? Rebecca had previously decided to go to Jeremiah's place if she had not seen him by Saturday, and today was Saturday. But should she go see him if he hadn't bothered to contact her? Surely he heard about what happened to Morgan. Surely he would think that I'd be upset that Morgan lost her job and he hasn't been here to comfort me. Rebecca felt disappointed in Jeremiah. She wanted a man who would be there to support all her decisions and comfort her in any times of trouble. These were qualities that Rebecca thought that Jeremiah had. That was, until Morgan showed up. Has Morgan shown up to teach me something? Has God arranged for all this to happen to show me that Jeremiah is the wrong man for me? Rebecca thought. God, show me your ways. Teach me your paths. What is it that you want for my life? Rebecca spoke aloud her prayer as she closed the front door. No, if he's being stubborn, then I can be just as stubborn, she thought. 
she had to stop her mind from wondering what Colin would do in this situation. Colin would have behaved very differently because Morgan was Colin's niece. She didn't want to dwell on what Colin would do, because she didn't think it fair to keep comparing the two men in her mind. Colin's not here anymore, and Jeremiah is. Jeremiah considered that Rebecca needed time to sort things out with Morgan. Rather than waste time, he had spent all Saturday looking at houses. He had managed to find a house that he thought might be very suitable for Rebecca and him to live in. Of course, all the houses close by the one he had picked out were owned by Amish folk. The current owners were also Amish, so they wouldn't have to disconnect electrical wires and phone wires and the like. It was already set up for their Amish way of life. Most of the homes he looked at were two stories. He figured that Rebecca and he should buy a house with just one level since this would be their last home. The home Jeremiah liked was just over 1,600 square feet, built on one level, and it had spectacular views. There were four bedrooms, two bathrooms, and even a one-bedroom guest quarters on a lower level. Jeremiah wondered whether it was a coincidence that the house had a perfect space for Morgan, or was God trying to tell him something? Jeremiah had imagined himself growing old and having a quiet life with Rebecca, never considering that someone else would have to come into consideration, as Morgan was. Jeremiah was anxious to show the home to Rebecca. The realtor said it wouldn't last long, but Jeremiah thought that was something that all realtors say, especially with the current market being so slow. Jeremiah sat in his usual chair on the porch and sipped on his mug of steaming hot coffee and wondered what Rebecca might be doing right now. He made up his mind he had been away from her for too long. Tomorrow would be the second Sunday with no gathering, so he decided that he would see Rebecca the very next day. He hoped things would not be strained between them. It was 11 o'clock on the Saturday night, and Morgan had still not come home. Rebecca was worried, very worried. She was considering calling a taxi and going to the Miller's house in an effort to locate her when she heard the clip-clop of horses' hooves on the road outside. Rebecca wanted to rush to the front door. She couldn't decide whether she was angry with Morgan or pleased that she had finally showed up. She ignored the urge to rush to meet her and stayed in the armchair and kept knitting. A few minutes later, Morgan breezed through the front door and Rebecca heard hoofbeats disappearing up the road. Morgan stood in the doorway of the living room. Rebecca, you're still awake? I told you to be home at... Rebecca could not remember what time she told Morgan to come home, but it definitely was not at this late hour. Before now, I didn't think you would mind me staying out later if I was having a good time. Morgan flopped in the couch opposite Rebecca. Jeremiah looked out to the distant fields. When I tell you to be home at a certain time, I expect you to do so. A little smile crept across Morgan's face. I'm sorry, Aunt Rebecca. Rebecca turned her attention back to her knitting. I'm in love, Rebecca. Truly in love. Morgan went from sitting to lying down on the couch. We just talked for hours. He told me all about his life and I told him all about mine. I've never met anyone like him before. He's just so sweet and nice, not like the boys back home. Did you remember all the things I told you? Morgan giggled. Yes, I remember all that you told me. So did you kiss him? Morgan sat upright. No, the farmer doesn't buy the cow if he can get the milk for free. Rebecca laughed. Where did you hear that? I heard it on television once. Anyway, I'm holding out. Good for you. Rebecca hoped she was having a positive effect on Morgan. Well, I'd best be going to bed now that you're safely home. Rebecca folded up her knitting. Sorry, Rebecca. You didn't need to wait up for me or anything. I'm not a child. Rebecca folded her knitting. I wouldn't have been able to sleep until you got home. Have you heard from Jeremiah? Rebecca rose to her feet and just shook her head before she said goodnight to Morgan. I'm going to start running every morning so I won't be here when you wake up. Just didn't want you to panic if I wasn't here, that's all. Rebecca smiled and was pleased that Morgan was learning some consideration. Thanks for letting me know. No, she had not heard from Jeremiah and she could not even speak about Jeremiah with Morgan. What would she say to Morgan? Morgan was the very reason that Jeremiah was keeping his distance. As Rebecca sank under the warm covers of her bed, she could not stop thinking of Jeremiah. Was it over between the two of them? Why had he left her alone when he must have known that she would have been so upset about Morgan losing the job? She missed him terribly. Did he miss her just as much?
Chapter 14 Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 11, 1 just as he did every Sunday morning, Jeremiah was fixing himself some bacon and eggs when he heard a loud knock on his door. He rarely had visitors in the morning, so he had no idea who it could be. When he opened the door, he was surprised to see Morgan. Morgan, what are you doing here? He looked around to see if Rebecca was with her. I'm here by myself. She's not with me. I wanted to have a talk with you, without her, without Aunt Rebecca. Jeremiah stepped aside. Come in, please. He motioned for her to go to the kitchen. I'm just fixing some bacon and eggs. Would you like some? Oh, yes, please. I'm starving. Morgan walked through the door and turned her head about, looking the place over. You've got a nice place here. It's a bit big for just me, he replied. Jeremiah walked to the kitchen and hoped that Morgan would follow him rather than poking around his living room. When Jeremiah saw that she was not behind him, he said, This way to the kitchen. Morgan pulled out a chair and sat at the kitchen table. Does Rebecca know you're here? He asked. Morgan shook her head vigorously. I told her I was running. Really? That's a fib, he said. Morgan clasped her hands on the table in front of her. I ran to the taxi, so it's not a fib. Jeremiah gave her a disapproving glance as he cracked the eggs. I like my eggs sunny side up and hard, please, she told him. Now I have a chance to make amends for my foolish ways. God has brought her right to my door. Now the rest is up to me, Jeremiah thought. Once the bacon and eggs were on the table, Jeremiah lowered his head. I always say thanks for the food. Morgan lowered her head, just as Jeremiah had, and closed her eyes. Dear Lord, thank you for this food and please bless it to our bodies and our service to you. Amen. Morgan looked up. That was fast. Prayers don't have to be long. They are measured by the heart, not the number of words. Now what did you come to speak with me about? He asked. Morgan picked up her knife and fork. Rebecca's really been missing you. She looked around. Did you make toast? Yeah, I left it over there. Jeremiah buttered the four pieces of toast and brought them back to the table. Did she say so? Did she say she missed me? As Jeremiah said the words, he felt a little silly. Here he was, a grown man, talking about the woman he loved as if he were a teenager. Morgan cut her toast carefully in two. No, but I can tell. She wouldn't speak to me about things like that because she sees me as just a child. I was planning on seeing her today, he said. Oh, this bacon's so good. Were you? You were going to see her today? Morgan popped a forkful of bacon in her mouth. Yeah. Jeremiah was touched that Morgan came out of her way to try and help his and Rebecca's relationship. I can take you back there if you like, rather than getting a taxi back. We can go when we finish breakfast. That would be great, thanks. Jeremiah shook his fork at Morgan. But strictly no driving the buggy for you, not after the last time, he told her. Morgan laughed a little. I'm sorry, it won't happen again. No, it won't. Jeremiah's tone was firm. I'm sorry to hear about what happened with the job, he said. Morgan looked up from arranging a piece of bacon and a little piece of egg on her fork. It's not your fault. Anyway, I'll find something else. I left the store unattended anyway. Looking back, I can see that was a terrible thing to do. But I wasn't thinking of that at the time. Jeremiah studied Morgan's face. Large, round, green eyes stood out against the backdrop of her pallid, gaunt face. Everyone makes mistakes. There's not a person alive who hasn't made big mistakes even if they tell you otherwise. Jeremiah leaned closer to Morgan. Just between you and me, I would not have made the same decision as Eli, he said, as he straightened his back. Really? Yeah, but I've handed the running of the business over to Eli and Paul, so I can't interfere with what they see fit, he told her. I understand. Thanks, Jeremiah. That makes me feel a lot better. Morgan beamed a big appreciative smile at Jeremiah which made his heart soften towards her a little further. He had always wanted a daughter as well as the two rough boys, but it never happened. As far as I can see, you are very impulsive, which means that you make decisions too quickly. You ran out of the shop without seeing things through, without talking about things, without thinking about things. It was the same as when you took off in my buggy. A quick decision, he said. Morgan popped the last mouthful of egg into her mouth. 
You're probably right. I do things quickly before I think. That's the way I am. Yeah, without thinking things through. Next time, before you make a decision, take a little time to fully think it through. Don't be in such a rush all the time, he said. Okay, that sounds like good advice. I'll try and do that, she replied. Now, as soon as I wash these plates, I'll get the buggy hitched up and we can be on our way. Do you want me to show you how to hitch up a buggy? He asked. Yes, please. I love horses. Morgan rose to her feet and carried the plates to the sink and wiped up while Jeremiah washed. As Jeremiah washed the few dishes that were in the sink, he couldn't help but wonder whether he had taken a dislike to Morgan, because she was a reminder of Colin, Rebecca's late husband. I've been unfair to both Morgan and Rebecca. Morgan can't help being Colin's niece, and Rebecca is doing her Christian duty giving young Morgan a safe place to live, Jeremiah thought. Rebecca had never mentioned Colin much, but he knew Rebecca had a great love for him. He often found himself wondering if he could ever take Colin's place in Rebecca's heart. Maybe Rebecca felt the same about his late wife. Just as Jeremiah had finished the last dish and handed it to Morgan to wipe, Morgan looked up at him through her clear, wide, green eyes. Jeremiah, I mean Mr. Troyer, would it be easier for you and Rebecca if I was not around? She asked. He was starting to see the good nature within this child, even if she was impulsive and brash. No, Rebecca and I did not see eye to eye about something. We will sort it out. We will sort it out today. Never you mind, he replied. With that being said, Morgan smiled, hung the tea towel on the hook to dry, and followed Jeremiah out to the barn. Rebecca was worried that Morgan was taking a very long time on her run, so she put on her flat shoes and decided to go for a walk in the hopes of finding her. With her nature, she's probably trying to do a marathon distance her first day out, Rebecca thought. Just as Rebecca was about to open the front door, she heard hoofbeats. She opened the door, expecting to see Jacob's gray buggy, but instead, Jeremiah's buggy just pulled up in front of her house. She was sure that she saw Morgan sitting in the passenger seat. Rebecca opened the door widely and stood just inside the door with her arms folded across her chest. Rebecca saw that Morgan whispered something to Jeremiah on their way to the house. That was a long run, young lady, Rebecca said as Morgan breezed past her. I went to Jeremiah's place by taxi. Before Rebecca could reprimand Morgan, she was halfway down the hallway. Now Rebecca was face to face with Jeremiah. I had no idea that you two were such good friends, Rebecca said. Jeremiah smiled down at Rebecca. Let's talk. Jeremiah put an arm around her shoulder and led her to their favorite spot in the garden. What was she doing at your place? Rebecca didn't care if Jeremiah had to be coaxed back to her place by Morgan. She was just glad that he was back with her again. And what did she whisper to you on the way from the buggy to the house? She said that she would go to her room so that we could talk, he said. As they sat down on the white seat under the tree, Jeremiah said, Rebecca, I've been a fool. Rebecca stared into his dark eyes. Maybe he had been a fool or maybe she had. What did it matter now that they were together again? I have failed. You've been a good Christian woman by looking after Morgan and opening up your house. I had the attitude of a heathen, and I'm sorry to you and to God, he said. Jeremiah stroked the side of Rebecca's face with one of his long fingers. Will you forgive me? Rebecca's heart beat a little faster at his touch. Of course I will. My heart was set hard against Morgan because I thought that she would remind you of Colin, he told her. Rebecca laughed. Since that girl's been here, I've had no time to think of anything. I'm sorry I haven't been around to help. Jeremiah picked up Rebecca's hand and squeezed it gently. But I have found a house that I think you would like, he told her. Really? You've looked for a house? Rebecca was glad that even though things had been very tense between them, Jeremiah had still been proceeding with the plans for their future together. Jeremiah nodded. It's all on one level, so it will do us in our later years. Wait till you see it, you'll love it. It's been renovated, new roof, new gutters, beautifully polished hardwood floors, and a spectacular view from the porch. I'm sure you'll love it. It's also got a basement set up as an apartment, just in case Morgan stays on, he replied. You wouldn't mind? Rebecca wiped a tear away from her cheek with the back of her hand. You wouldn't mind if she stayed a while after we're married, she asked. As long as we're together, I don't mind anything. All I know is that I want to spend the rest of my days with you by my side. If that means Morgan comes along, that's fine, he said. 
Jeremiah pulled Rebecca's hand closer toward him. Rebecca, can you ever forgive me for being a stubborn old man? He asked. No, never. Rebecca looked at him with a serious face, then could not help but laugh. Of course I can, my love. Rebecca hesitated a moment before she said, You heard about Morgan getting fired? Yeah, and I don't agree with that decision, he said. You don't? Rebecca was sure that he would have approved. Everyone deserves a second chance. God gave us a second chance, didn't he? He asked. A second chance? A second chance at love, he said as he breathed a sigh of relief and a smile brightened his handsome face. I thought I'd lost you forever, he told her. No, you would never have lost me, Jeremiah Troyer. Rebecca put her head on Jeremiah's shoulder. You've just made me the happiest woman in the world. Rebecca sent up a silent prayer of thanks to God. Everything looked like it was going to work out perfectly. Kate had even offered for both Morgan and herself to stay at their place after Rebecca was baptized. It looked like, after she and Jeremiah got married, that they would have a house to live in together. A house without memories or past loves. A house where they could make new memories together. I think you and I are a match made in heaven. Jeremiah tilted his head to the side and rested it on the top of Rebecca's head. I believe we are, Rebecca. I believe we are. You have been listening to A Second Chance Amish Romance Secrets Book 5 Written by Samantha Price Narrated by Susanna Coleman Copyright 2014 by Samantha Price Production Copyright 2023 by Samantha Price